Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Radio Network's on Sunday, February 23rd, 2014, this is episode 1060. Enjoy. The Tech Eye Podcast is brought to you by Zip Recruiter. Zip Recruiter makes hiring faster, easier, and cheaper. Post your job to 50 plus job boards with one click. Try Zip Recruiter for a free four day trial right now at ziprecruiter.com slash tech guy. That's ziprecruiter.com slash tech guy. And by ShareFile. Enhance your workflow. Send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile from Citrix. Try ShareFile today for a 30-day free trial. Go to ShareFile.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter Tech Guy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the Tech Guy. And it's time to talk. Um, tech! <laughs> Computers, the internet, cell phones, I had to think about it. Uh, the uh, internet, computers, cell phones, home theater, our digital photography guru is coming up in just a little bit. Mr. Chris Marquardt, talk about digital photography. 8888 Ask Leo, that's the number if you want to call with a question, a comment, a suggestion. It's toll free from anywhere in the U.S. and Canada. Outside that area, though, you know, you can still call us. In fact, we have, we have listeners all over the world thanks to the internet. You can always use your Skype or voice over IP product of some kind. Tango, Viber, there's a lot of them. Don't think you can use WhatsApp. <laughs> Did you see uh, that WhatsApp was down for like hours yesterday? What? Yeah. I wonder, <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg is probably going, it's like buying a car and you pull out of the lot and the engine falls out. It's like, What? I spent $16 billion for this car. <laughs> and the engine just pfft, fell right out of it. <laughs> I'm sure it's just a minor glitch. Probably what it is is uh, script kiddies. We call, that's what we call the kind of non-sophisticated, non-intelligent hackers who are at least just smart enough, barely smart enough to run somebody else's hacking script. Uh, launching a, what we call a distributed denial of service. Welcome to the dark side of the internet. Distributed denial of service, or DDoS, or DDoS attack. It's very easy to do nowadays, particularly because there's recently we've discovered some serious vulnerabilities in the way the internet's constructed. A, a guy with a, a very poor internet connection, a megabit internet connection, that's nothing, right? You have more than that. A uh, megabit internet connection. Uh, can launch a an attack of uh, upwards of 400 gigabits per second, 400 billion bits per second against a site. By doing that, these are called amplification attacks. By doing that, of course, most sites you have that much bandwidth aimed at you are going to go down. Now, WhatsApp must have a lot of cleverly designed bandwidth because they have half a billion users. So they they certainly have figured out a way to handle millions, tens of millions of messages a minute. Um, and that's the kind of traffic we're talking about. So whatever attacked them or brought them down, if that's what happened, maybe they just, somebody blew it, pushed the wrong button. Seems unlikely. But if that's what happened, um, then I'm sorry. You heard about this, right? So Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, he's got crazy money. We call it, I call it stupid money. The kind of money, so much money that you can spend it dumbly and survive. He spent 10% of his company, 10% of his company's valuation, Facebook's valuation, on a smartphone app. What? Not only that, a smartphone app that really didn't make very much money. I think it made, uh, it, it, uh, what was it? I read it somewhere. $40 million, uh, last year, something like that, $400 million. Even if they made a billion last year, <laughs> you'd take 19 years to pay it back because he... So what Zuckerberg, what Zuck did is they gave $12 billion, you do the math here, $12 billion U.S. worth of Facebook stock, because it's kind of inflated right now, so that was, that was easy. $4 billion in greenbacks, American dollar, 
four billion dollars, and then promised another three billion dollars over the next few years in stock for performance. So a total of potentially nineteen billion, nineteen billion, not million, nineteen. <laughs> and remember when he bought Instagram for a billion, everybody went, "Whoa, whoa!" I feel queasy. That's nothing. Remember when Snapchat turned down $3 billion and everybody, including me, said, they're crazy, they should take their money and run. Yeah, maybe they weren't so crazy. <laughs> Robert Reich, the former U.S. Secretary of Labor, says that that acquisition, the $19 billion acquisition, is everything that's wrong with the U.S. economy. What? He writes in the Salon, if you ever... Wonder what's fueling America's staggering inequality, the income inequality. Ponder Facebook's acquisition of mobile messaging company WhatsApp for $19 billion, the biggest price paid for a startup in history. That's $3 billion more than Facebook raised when it was first listed, more than twice what Microsoft paid for Skype, twice what Microsoft paid for Skype. He says, given uh, that giant amount, you might wonder, well, WhatsApp must be a pretty big company, right? Tens of thousands of employees worldwide. No, 35, sorry, 55 employees <laughs> in Mountain View, California. What, what Facebook bought was 450 million users all around the world. And all around the world is kind of underscore that. WhatsApp, you may not even have heard of it. I bet you haven't. A lot of people haven't, unless you have friends overseas, because it's not widely used in the U.S. We're pretty content using uh, either text messaging or the messaging apps that came with our smartphones like Facebook Messenger, Google's Hangouts, Google Messenger, Apple's Messages. That's what people in the U.S. use. But around the world, WhatsApp is very popular because it does things those can't. First of all, it sends text messages without using text messaging infrastructure. It just uses the Internet, plain old data. Uh, you could send not just text but pictures, audio, video. My friend Alan Tepper, who is uh, uh, Castilian, he's from Spain, he says uh, he likes it because it can handle the uh, diacritical uh, marks over letters, you know, the uh, accents and the circumflexes and things, better than uh, most text messaging apps can. It uh, is very popular in Russia because it handles Cyrillic. It's very popular in Israel because it can go right to left instead of left to right, and it handles uh, non-Roman non characters. So this is, a, this is what Facebook bought. Robert Reich says its value comes from two other things that require only a handful of people. First, it's technology, a simple but powerful app. Now, I would say, Robert, you probably don't know much about technology because it's not that complicated. In fact, Facebook's already purchased a very similar app called Beluga many years ago. They have that technology. Facebook Messenger does everything that WhatsApp does. So that's not particularly impressive. That's not what they bought it for. They WhatsApp Messenger, pff, nah, mm -hmm. that's nothing. They bought Beluga in 2011, uh, and and basically turned it into Facebook Messenger. It did all the same exact things. Oh, by the way, Facebook bought it and killed it. <laughs> I was a Beluga user. I liked Beluga, and pff, and that was it. We don't know exactly what they paid for Beluga, but it probably was not more than a hundred million dollars. In fact, you know, WhatsApp wasn't very valuable either. Uh, its investors had valued it, I think, at uh, a billion or two just very recently. Nobody expected $19 billion. The second reason Robert Reich said Facebook bought uh, uh, WhatsApp, and I think he's right on this one, is what's called the network, network effect. That's what made Facebook so big. The more people use it, the more other people use it because your friends and family are using it, so you have to use it. That's what makes any instant messenger a success. It's why in the United States, originally we used, remember, ICQ? But that was big in the U.S. Outside the U.S., uh, in Canada, for instance, everybody used uh, Microsoft Messenger. That was the big app. And because all your friends were on it in Canada, that's what you used. Messenger never really took off in the U.S., but it was big in other countries. There, there have been many of these. WhatsApp is growing fast. Its worldwide usage, usage did just double to 450 million. And it's growing by about a million users every day. I would guess after the announcement this week that Facebook just bought them, they've probably gained more than that. 
I certainly, I re-downloaded it. I hadn't used it in ages. I re-downloaded it. Now get this. On one day, the last day of the year, 2013, <laughs> it handled 54 billion messages in one day. In one day. Why is it bad for the economy? Well, we'll find out. Because <laughs> I didn't even get to that part of his article. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Your calls coming up. I saw Netflix made a deal with Comcast. That's really sad. Saddens me. <sighs> because, and the reason they did it is because Cogent was fighting it. It's really an interesting story, actually. 50 plus new 100 millionaires. I probably, I know uh, Jan Coom or Jan Coom, the, uh, one of the founders, uh, is now worth $6 billion. He has uh, a significant amount of a stake, obviously. He hasn't get, they didn't give up much. What he says is not good for the economy because all of that investment doesn't gain more jobs, doesn't get more jobs. But that's the, you know, that's kind of the nature of uh, technology, isn't it? That's right, BBM. Although BBM is now cross messenger, cross uh, platform. Yeah, WhatsApp is close to sending more messages than the total SMS worldwide. Uh, it's bad A5 because it sets a bad precedent. Yes, uh, as a user of Comcast, you're happy. But basically, Comcast held you hostage and said to Netflix, eh, you know, we're not going to give uh, your customers good service on our network unless you give us more money. That's why it's bad, because you pay them already for access, full and free and free-flowing access to the Internet. You're not getting what you're paying for. And it sets a precedent because now other people who want to get to you, like Google, YouTube, are going to be highly pressured to pay Comcast for access to you. It's what another reason Comcast is the worst company in America. The worst company in America. They're horrendous. They're worse than Frank Underwood. <sighs> All Netflix played for was the interconnect. You don't understand how the internet works, my friend. <laughs> That is not right. It's called the internet. It's a free and free flowing bits. Bits are bits. It's called net neutrality. No internet service provider should be able to hold you hostage, could kidnap you and your eyeballs and say, sorry, Comcast, you don't get to our users unless you pay us more money. They're already making money from us. Yeah, Rogers is pretty bad too, Virgil. We are getting up early, Jeff. I think Nokia's going to do an Android phone. I don't know how crazy that is, but that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, we'll be broadcasting 11.30 p.m. Pacific tonight. <laughs> oh, Mike Elgin and I will be up late. Uh, that'll be 11.30 Pacific is uh, 2.30 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, is uh, 8.30 a.m. UTC. 0830 UTC. Oh, you work for Comcast A5? Oh, now I understand. <laughs> the worst company in America? Yeah. <laughs> now I understand A5. <laughs> he works for Comcast. <laughs> no, no, my company's good. They're good people. Really, they are. Mm -hmm. And Frank Underwood is a is a civil servant who cares about the American people. <clears throat> what is Netflix going to say? Those suckers at Comcast held us up. Netflix, they have them by the short hairs. But it sets a bad precedent for me, for instance. Because I also stream to you. What if Comcast comes to me and says, oh, you're using up a lot of bandwidth. You really ought to pay us for that. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 
8888-ASK-LEO. That's my phone number, 888-827-5536. Just to wrap this WhatsApp deal up, the reason former Secretary of Labor uh, under uh, Bill Clinton, Robert Reich, says it's a bad idea is because those $19 billion that, Netflix, that uh, Facebook spent to acquire an app, <laughs> let's, I mean, really, it's, it's a smartphone app. And I guess, you know, mostly the smartphone app's users. Uh, get, makes no new jobs, adds nothing to the economy. It's, uh, it's, it's, and really, it's funneling the money that Facebook raised in its stock offering from investors right into WhatsApp. Now, if, if you bought Facebook stock and you're an investor, that's the kind of thing you gave them money to do, I guess. And you better hold on. I think it's crazy money. I think it's stupid money. I think it's a complete waste of money. There are many, many cases in the industry. Most notably, America Online buying Time Warner for much more money of just wasted, wasted money. And uh, I'm sure that's really what Robert Reich is thinking. This is just throwing your money away. On the other hand, there are 55 employees who are 100 millionaires and two founders who are multi, multi billionaires who are very happy today. Very, very happy. Um, and if I were a Facebook stockholder, I'm not. I don't buy tech stock uh, so that I can be objective about all this stuff. And you don't, more importantly, so, the, so you don't think, well, Leo's got a stake in this. I don't have a financial stake in any tech, tech, tech companies. Um, but if I were a Facebook stockholder, I'd be concerned. 10% of the company on an app? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's, a, that's a lot of money for an app. And by the way, an app, the, the technology of which they already have, the, what they don't have is the 450 million users. But I have to point out, and I think Facebook knows this, in fact, this is really what scares the heck out of them, is those users are only there until something better comes along. And what the Facebook's painfully aware of that because they put MySpace practically out of business when they came along, the problem with the network effect that we were talking about earlier, you're there because your friends are there, is if your friends all leave, you follow. And it happens very abruptly. It can happen almost instantaneously. How many people still use ICQ? Everybody used it for a while. Nobody uses it now. It's still around. Uh, people move on. And the problem is it's, it's the, the influencers in this are often young people who are notoriously fickle. So I'd hate I'd hate to spend up to nineteen billion dollars on something that in six months could have you know a hundred million users or ten million users easily. Easily, eighty eight eighty eight. Ask Leo, what do you think? <laughs> it's not just me; it's you too. What do you think? Eighty eight eighty eight. Ask Leo, did you, uh, Heather Hamman, Phone Ranger, did you install WhatsApp? I did. Oh, and what do you think? use it yet. So. You don't know anybody who uses it. Maybe That's why. I don't. <laughs> There's no network effect there because uh, it's not widely used in the U.S. I used it uh, only because I was chatting with people overseas and they like it and so I use it. Oh, okay. I'll add you. Yeah, let's WhatsApp. Let's like WhatsApp each other. Or something. It's, you know, the, the one thing that makes it a little different than, say, Facebook Messenger is the way you identify a person is by phone number. And it uses, so it's essentially like Facebook except instead of you adding friends... With WhatsApp, you it's whoever's in your contact list. So it goes okay. out, looks at your phone's contact list, and now you can message any of those people or invite others to okay. a message. Good thing you. I wasn't playing with it last night. I don't want to know. <laughs> what just, were you I doing? Had a couple beers. I would oh. been like, Leo. Yeah, you don't want a drunk WhatsApp. <laughs> Leo, I don't know actually. Chat. I have no Leo, idea about that. But you can do that because you would that's you know, okay, so why do kids use Snapchat? Take a quick picture, send it off. That's the kind of thing they use WhatsApp for. Um, that, but some people say, oh, it's going to make money. It could make money because we could u they could use it for transactions in countries where banking isn't easily uh, available, you know, uh, or, and credit cards aren't widely used. So India or China, it's not very popular in China, oddly enough. They have their own Chinese WhatsApp. Maybe Facebook will buy that too. Who should I talk to uh, before we uh, go go on and on on this? Um, we have to talk to David and Rosita because it's just such an oh, interesting no. question. All right. <laughs> David and Rosita, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, David. Hey, Leo. Um, so I got an LED Vizio uh, refurbished, and uh, I, I turned it on for the first hour. I turned it off. It was all right. Turned it back on and maybe had it on for two hours, and it starts 
the room starts smelling like burnt marshmallows, like some mores. <laughs> I don't know if that's normal. That's not normal. Did you see any smoke coming out of it? No, not at all. But you just smelled that way. Just and it continued good. to operate okay? Yeah, perfectly. Netflix was perfect. Okay. It may be that it, it is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, as it heats up, of course, off-gassing a little bit of something. I don't know what. Um, it, generally, when electronics uh, first comes on, you might have a small, small amount of, of odor, but you really shouldn't smell s'mores. <laughs> and uh, my, my fear is it will, in fact, start smoking, and if it does, immediately turn it off. Did you get it from Vizio? No. Okay. It's selling refurbished. Yeah. But not by Vizio. So my strong advice, and I've said it many times before, is do not... Refurbished can mean a lot of things. In this case, I can almost promise you, whoever sold it to you, got it back because it, it had a problem. Maybe it was smoked. Maybe it smelled like s'mores. And they just sold it back to you. They didn't refurbish it. They just... Maybe they put it in a nicer box. They put it in a new box. That's why when, I, when you get refurbished, always get refurbished from the manufacturer. Because generally what will happen is the manufacturer will get, will warranty it as if it's new. And this is what you really hope for in this case because I fear that something is not right. This is not normally what you want. You do not want your TV to smell like s'mores. Uh, when manufacturers sell refurbs, Apple, Vizio, Dell, often they're just computers that were sold, shipped to the consumer. The consumer opened it and then got regret. And state law in California, in fact, law in many states, says you cannot sell an open box like that as if as new. Even though it may never even have been turned on. It could have been returned right away. But as soon as the box is open, it's not new anymore. That's the law requires that. So they sell it as refurbished with some discount. When you get it from the manufacturer, chances are that's what you're getting, especially if you're getting a current model and it has a full warranty. I don't like getting third-party refurbs. I really don't. Um, my guess, and I think Bash is right in the chat room, that uh, you should look at the capacitors under the heat sink of the power supply if you really feel like investigating. If there's a little oil on them, if they're leaking, then you've really got a problem. And, and this, I think, is what's probably happening. If the capacitors are leaking, the oil that's coming out of them is, is getting heated and vaporized, and you're smelling s'mores, eventually they'll fail. It's also possible that somebody did use it to make s'mores and a little bit of chocolate and marshmallow dripped into the inside, and that could be harmless. I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> I can pretty much guarantee you this is not how Vizio envisioned it. <laughs> and I've had several Vizio TVs. None of them smelled like graham crackers, marshmallow, and chocolate. None of them. So something's wrong. You should take it back. Hope that they will take it back. Often when you get it from a third party, it's as is. In that case, cross your fingers. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, you, sh you should pay extra for the s'more smell. That's good stuff. You know, Leo, we've been asking around. Yes. This is a very unusual cable. Nobody seems to want to claim it. So some... I know what it is. Oh, you know what it is? Sure, I know exactly what it is. What has a weird connector like that? Is it an RJ11? Well, but look where the connector is. The little latch is off the, not in the center. Yeah. It's, um... I would guess... Here, we'll do this for the, the chat room's benefit. I would guess it's, you know, a battery connecting to a device that it's attached to or something like that. You know, obviously, it's purpose-built, short. Yeah, yeah. And and he's saying what's weird is the is the lock on this is instead of centered as it is on an RJ11 or an RJ45, it's offset. And it was, on, it was on the radio corner cable, and Padre says it's not his. Um, so we're just trying to figure out <laughs> if anybody recognizes it. Hmm. Hmm. Is it off center on both of them? Yeah. Heather says, "Ah, just throw it away." Yeah. No, no. The reason it's off center is because it's not it's not a generic cable. Center, it's really? yeah, and so it's designed for I you know some device like a battery that goes underneath it and it hooks into it, or a phone, or it could be a what part of the one of the radios. Um. 
Oh, some of the ham equipment. It could be ham equipment. So don't just don't throw it away. Put it put it keep it keep it near there. Uh, I don't recognize it from any of our ham equipment, but uh, it it's for some it's proprietary for something that has an a, you know an external box, and that's why ham it might be a, it might be ham equipment, it might be like an external antenna. But I wouldn't I wouldn't throw it away. Yeah. Base in the handset. For months, Netflix and Comcast have been in a standoff over Netflix requests that Comcast connect to a Netflix video distribution network free of charge. This is in everybody's interest. Netflix uh, wanted to put servers in the cable company's office, which would have been happy. For, everybody would have been happy. But Comcast wanted to be paid for connecting due to the heavy load of traffic Netflix would send in the cable operator's network. That heavy load of traffic is the traffic that people who pay Comcast for Internet access are expecting. Under the deal, Netflix won't be able to place its servers inside the data centers, which they'd wanted. Instead, Comcast will connect to Netflix servers at data centers operated by other companies. The company is Cogent, by the way, and Comcast has been holding Cogent ransom, holding our, its customers ransom to Cogent for not just Netflix, but other companies. Reed Hastings, CEO at Netflix, decided to try, strike the deal after Netflix saw a deterioration in streaming speeds for Comcast subscribers. Hmm... Hmm, wonder why that was. <laughs> the average speed of Netflix primetime streams to Comcast had dropped 27% since October. I wonder why. So they, basically, they held, uh, Com Comcast held Net uh, their customers' ransom for Netflix. You would, if you would like to have full speed to your customer, your... Uh Viewers, you might want to consider a special deal. During this period, Netflix was using Cogent as a primary route to Comcast. That connection was being overwhelmed with Netflix. Now, see, this is the problem, is the interpretation. Comcast would say, well, it's being overwhelmed with Netflix traffic. But that's Cogent's trying to peer with Comcast, which is the normal the normal thing that happens. It's not normal for Comcast to say, oh, you can peer with us, but you got to give us money. That's what's not normal. Would you find it? No, the chat room determined. Yes. RJ12. It's a 12. It is a standard, the RJ12. Yeah. It's usually, it says it's usually using telecom. Telecom. Okay. Not just Our show today brought to you by ZipRecruiter. I should mention ZipRecruiter. This is a great idea. If you're looking for work or you know somebody who's looking for work or you are an employer looking for employees, ZipRecruiter makes it easy there are a lot of job boards out there. Where do you start? ZipRecruiter. It will file your listing at 50-plus job boards with a single click of your mouse. And it does more because it also posts your job on the social networks like Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Google+. We've used them and with great results, by the way. They'll add your company logo and colors to make your job pages an extension of your business. You can add unlimited users to your account, create an instant job page on your website, include a company careers page to use as a careers link. It's so easy. You post once and you watch the qualified candidates roll in to the ZipRecruiter interface. Very easy to use. ZipRecruiter.com. It also it does a little parsing and automatically highlights the best candidates. You screen them, rate them, and hire the right person fast. If you have to do hiring, ZipRecruiter is great. And right now, you could try ZipRecruiter free for a four-day trial. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash tech guy. ZipRecruiter.com slash tech guy. And you can try it free for four days and get a sense of what ZipRecruiter can do for you. It's so efficient, so fast, so easy. You probably have your employee hired in four days. ZipRecruiter, Z-I-P-R-E-C-R. U I T E R dot com slash tech guy. The best way to post jobs. Look at all the places it posts them. So good. So good. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, eighty eight eighty eight ask Leo. Eric uh is next in Corona, California. Hi, Eric. Leo Laporte here. Hi. Um my question is, uh, do you know or can you recommend a good company for Data recovery on a RAID 5 uh, server? So you have a RAID 5 server. It's and and uh, 
more than one disc died? Yes. Oh, man. Um, gee, I don't know if data recovery is even possible. RAID 5 is designed to allow failure of a disc because of data redundancy. But if too many discs fail at the same time, then um, you've lost enough data that the recovery uh, can't be, you know, you can't add another disc. I don't know of anybody who specializes in um, in RAID recovery. Anybody in the chat room have any suggestions? You know, I know, of course, a company like uh, Drive Savers, which specialize, you might call them anyway. Uh, they're friends of mine I, down the down the road a piece. They specialize in single drive recovery. Yeah, I looked. I was I was looking, and I saw that there were uh, companies that claim RAID five. But then I go to the reviews, and you start seeing that they're they're not true. So. Yeah, I mean, I guess one way to do it would be to take the discs that failed and try to get them back and running. Depends why they failed. So I don't, drive savers is very expensive, and I don't recommend it for for what I call soft failures. Failures uh, due to data being incorrectly written on the drive or something like that. They're they're so expensive because they, they fix hardware failures. You know, uh, the platters get scratched, or uh, which would make it difficult to recover, by the way. But let's say it's not that. Maybe, maybe the bearings died in the platters. The data is still on the platters. They just won't spin because the bearings wore out. Well, drive savers in a clean has a clean room environment this is why it's so expensive they take it apart they have replacement parts for all kinds of hard drives they put new bear you know they put the platters in with new bearings and it all works fine because your data never got hurt it's just the drive couldn't spin because the bearings failed so it's very dependent and that's why i wouldn't trust these reviews on the kind of failure you had drive savers and no data recovery company you know they're not magicians they're things they can do uh, but there's some kinds of failures. You know, if, if there's a gouge, let's say the, you know, the, the head on hard drives floats above the disc, never touches the disc. Let's say that you had a head crash where it hit the disc, gouged out a chunk of material. Well, that data's lost. No data recovery company can get it back. It's gone. Right, right. So it really, de it's dependent on the kind of failure you had. And of course, you don't know. It's hard to tell. Was there a rattling? Why did two drives fail at the same time? That's the question. Um, the I don't know. Power power uh, surge or something? I probably because I got a call that the 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 server rebooted first. Yeah. All I got, and then the next call I got is the server didn't come back oh, up. So. Yeah, I've had this happen to me. But of course, we always have backups. You don't have a backup, huh? Um, we had backups for most of it, but there was one particular got thing it. that wasn't yeah. on the backup. Yeah. You also can lose a controller, and uh, that can cause it. But that's easy because you replace it. The data is still on the hard drive. Um, it really is. An, it, it, so even on servers, even on RAID 5 servers, to trust that and say, hey, that's I got it's RAID 5. What could possibly go wrong? Well, the RAID array could explode, and all, all the disks could be blown up. You, you, backups are always critical. One copy of anything, I don't care on how magical that thing is, is not enough. So uh, I don't, you know, I, I would call Drive Savers. I know them. They're great guys. They're not going to rip you off. They're the guys that got a lot of press because they hired a couple of years ago uh, a counselor from a suicide hotline, a specialist in, in grief counseling because, well, you can hear it in Eric's voice. When you, have that, when you have that file and it's gone forever, sometimes somebody who can say, breathe deep. It's going to be okay. You're still on the planet. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's scary. Um, I, I, I don't know what to say. I would call them and, and see, and tell them Leo, uh, mentioned it. They don't, they're not an advertiser. I've just known them for years and, um, and say, look, I need, this is what happened. If you don't do raid five recovery, who does raid five recovery? Essentially all carbonite would, I mean, uh, carbonite, all, um, uh, drive savers would do, I would guess is look at the individual drives to try to get them back. Cause then you could re then the raid array is intact. And you can get the data off. The way RAID works means that data may be on different disks and so forth. And so it's a little tricksy. Um, I don't. I don't have a good answer for you, Eric. I, you have my sympathy. I don't mean to. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not berating you uh, for not having a backup. I'm just using you as an example to everybody that this is why you got to have a backup. Just because something's a RAID five, and I'm. Hey, I've lost data on my servers. Absolutely. Uh, it's happened to me. 
Uh, and I learned the lesson. You only It only happens if you're <laughs> paying attention. It should only happen once. And ever after, I have uh, regular data backups to a separate data center, not even to the same building. My, uh, my servers are in Seattle. I'm on a company called SoftLayer, and we back it up to uh, servers in Dallas. Now, if the, in <laughs> if the entire continent's nuked, well, then I guess I'll lose my data. But that's, uh, I figure at that point, I don't really care anyway. 8888 Ask Leo. There are a number of other companies that do this, and I'm just not familiar with them. I've used Drive Savers. I don't know the rest of them. Um, UJ in the chat room is saying, myharddrivefailed.com. Whenever I see a, a domain, a vanity URL like that, I think, I don't know. That makes me a little nervous. But maybe that's one to try. Uh, iPad22252 says, crawlontrack.com, K-R-O-L-L-O-N-T-R-A-C-K.com. Um, Drive Savers does do uh, raid data recovery. So I, they'd be the first people I'd call. They're, they're absolutely trustworthy. Michael, Long Beach, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello, Leo. How are you today? I'm well. How are you? Good. Uh, I have uh, two questions, and if it's, they're fast, maybe I have a third. Okay. But uh, first of all, I have IDX extensions on a lot of my uh, files in my picture folder. Yeah, that's index. Yeah, I figured it's index, but I don't know. Can I just get rid of those? Uh, yeah, you generally can. Those aren't... Those aren't um the actual original images. What program do you use to keep track of your images? Well, I'm not very... Uh, I used to use ACDC, but then when I went to Windows 7, that doesn't work. So now I, I'm not using anything. It could be Windows itself that's making the uh, the index. You know, when you have a picture folder, Windows is smart enough to say, oh, it's a folder full of pictures. I'm going to make thumbnails. I'm going to make an index. But generally, and I don't know of any program that... Uh, generally, deleting the index file doesn't do anything, except... Delete the index file, so whatever search program you were using or cataloging right. program, it's going to say, oh, I just lost my catalog. I don't know what you got. Okay, my other question is I'm uh, trying to back up all of my documents and pictures, and how I do that is I have a separate uh, uh, hard drive, a one terabyte hard drive. Good. It has all my pictures, Good. and then I am just get another terabyte hard drive, and I just copy them all over. But then next month, when I go to copy ones that are new, how do I do that? Because so I'm here's kidding. you're very you're very close to the perfect solution. <laughs> it's exactly what I do. So, uh, but I use a, a drive synchronization program. So periodically, I, I always have uh, on my desktop computer. I have I use Lightroom as uh, uh, my photo. I have that one too. Yeah, yeah but you, whatever you use doesn't matter. Um, so when I get home from a day of shooting, I take out the memory card. I import it into Lightroom. Lightroom moves all the files into a hierarchy on my local hard drive. Um, I then automatically have that synchronized, and you could, there's a lot, I'll tell you a few programs that'll do this automatically, to a second external hard drive. And then once a week, I uh, swap that external hard drive with another one, which I bring to work. So I, this, is a, this is a complete backup up, up, up to last week, basically, of everything that's at home in case I lose everything at home. But let me talk a little bit about synchronization because that's the key. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, right after this. Oh. Yeah, because the key is the software you use. I use on, uh, I'm on a Mac, so I use a, a Mac program, but I'll tell them some Windows programs too. What's, I always mention uh, Sync Toy and um, Second Copy, and then somebody in the chat room always brings up another one, which I can never remember the name of, which I have to sync back. That's it. Thank you, Jeff. That's a shareware. Is it free? This is an easy thing to do, so there's a lot of programs like that. Sync back from two bright sparks. There's a free and a paid. Okay. You said that uh, Sunday is Sunday sandwich, sandwich day. Oh, I don't know. It's such it's so bad for me to have that big loaf of bread. Oh. Say again, darling. <laughs> Chef salad. It's got all of that without the bread. You're right. That's what I do. I take an idea. And of look a how slender and, and attractive she is because she takes the sandwich and <laughs> removes the bread. <laughs> I got to stop eating bread. That's bread and pasta. Of course, I made a big pot 
of bolognese sauce last night. Mm. And bought some bow ties, some You farfalla. better give that to me so that you don't eat it. It's good. Well, you got, I could just eat that. <laughs> that's okay. It's the pasta that's the problem. Oh, oh, oh. And I cannot not eat pasta. I've, I've discovered if there's cooked pasta anywhere in the house, I will find it and snarf it. I think pasta's not so bad. Well, I'm an, I grew up in an Italian household. You gotta eat It's my that. comfort food. Yeah. My mom says... She eats a low-carb pasta, which I haven't discovered yet. I've looked for it. Hmm. So, um, John, <laughs> John, I don't think they have chef salads at the market. Well, we can throw chicken in it. They have a salad bar. Yeah, yeah can you make me a, do you mind getting me a salad or have Spencer get me a salad? Thank you. Oh. Yeah, you know what I like. Chick, put a little chicken in it. You know what I like. Just no carbs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Leo. Dreamfield's low-carb pasta is a sham. That sounds right. <laughs> no, thank you. Too good to be true. So I take, I make a sofrito, a sofrit. I take a chop up a carrots, a celery, a onion, and I, uh, fr you know, I cook it until it's translucent in a little olive oil and butter. And then I put it a hamburger meat and top of that. But you don't brown it. You just cook it, but you don't want it to brown. You just want it to cook. And then you put... Um, a little white wine in there, and you cook it that until the white wine evaporates, and then you put, and this is the key to bolognese, you put a little milk in there, and a little bit, not a little half a cup, quarter cup, just a little bit of milk to cut the acidity and then put it in there, and then you put it in cans of, uh, I use Italian San Marino diced tomato, I put two big cans of that, I put a can of tomato sauce and a can of tomato paste to give it a rich flavor, and I put it all in there, and I'm, I let it cook, he's been cooking for it 17 hours. <laughs> I, st I started it last night at 5, cooked till 10, I turned it off overnight, and it's on again, I probably should turn it off now. It's a very rich, delicious, you know, you cover it a little bit, but you let a little bit of the did anyone write all that down? Because that does sound That's good. That's a bolognese. It's a classic of bolognese. <laughs> it's a very good. But see, I could just put that on a plate and eat it. Because it's... <laughs> you could put a... If you put a spoon in it, it stands up. Oh, and then... I'm lazy. This is a bad thing. I should make meatballs, but meatballs are a pain. You don't have to bake them and you have to boil it's a pain so uh, bruce adels makes delicious meatballs which i buy and then I put them in there just for a little more meat that's right that's how you make the sunday gravy leo laporte the tech guy 8888 ask leo we're talking about backup we always do it's it's a great subject uh with michael he's uh he takes photographs and he wants to save those photographs. And if they're very valuable, you, I always look to what pros do. Because a professional photographer, you're a wedding photographer. You cannot afford to lose those pictures. If, you, if you're if you a pro, if you your livelihood is on this, these guys know. So I, and by the way, after I import the pictures in Lightroom and I put them on the hard, I keep the, I don't wipe the memory card right away. I don't wipe it until I need it. And I have maybe eight of them. So I rotate through them. So I even have another copy on the memory card if I needed to go back to originals sometime in the next few weeks. Uh... And, the, and so the idea is you've got a, you've got three copies now. I have the original on my computer. I have a, a, a backup right next to it on a hard drive. That's online all the time, so it's always available. And then I have the off-site copy on a hard drive. And you can use Carbonite for this. It's just that I have so many pictures, it's faster for me just to copy it to an external hard drive and then swap this periodically, bring it in and uh, swap it with the duplicate hard drive at home. Now, the key is the synchronization software, right? Are you on Windows, Michael, or Macintosh? Windows 7. Oh, yeah, I knew that. You said it. So um, there's three different programs, depending on how fancy you want to get. Microsoft makes a free one that works pretty well. It's called SyncToy. And if you Google S-Y-N-C-T-O-Y, you'll get it right away. And that's free. Um, there uh, are shareware programs that I like better. They're a little more sophisticated. Um, my friend Jeff, Jeff Needles, says SyncBack is the one he likes to use. And that is from... 2brightsparks.com, the number 2brightsparks.com. And they have a free version. And if you like the free version, then you can get the uh, the, the shareware SE version. Or they even have a pro version. There's all th there's three editions. You know, the, th the free is probably going to do everything you need. For years, I've also used a program called Second Copy. Same idea. All three of them do the same thing. 
Second copy is from Centered Systems. They look at the files, and they are basically duplicating. They're making duplicate folders on the external drive and the internal drive. One thing you want to be careful about, though, all of these have the capability, if you delete a file on the internal drive to delete it on the external drive, you do not want that. Do not have, do not sync deletes. Only, you want to have a super copy on the external drive. So if you delete a file locally, you still have the copy. It's pretty straightforward. So I run this on a schedule periodically. Uh, sync toy, one of the, because it's free, one of the things that's missing is a scheduler. You have to use the built-in Windows scheduler. Some people say that's easy. Some people find it a little tricky. Second copy has a built-in scheduler. I'm sure uh, Syncback does as well. So it will run, say, nightly. Uh, it's really nice to have that. In fact, not just for photos, but documents too. Anything that you, you, know, you want to make sure you always have a copy of. Does that make sense? Okay, that's, that's great. Do I have time for one? Why not? Okay. I just went from XP because you told me to. Good. I bought a copy of uh, uh, Windows 7 Professional. Good man. And uh, I, but how I put it, I do things kind of probably not the right way. What I did is I bought another hard drive, and I put it in, and it was drive F. And when Windows went to put it on, I told it to put it on drive F. Good. So now I have it on there, but for me to, if I just start the computer up, it goes up into... Yeah, you have to convince the computer that your boot drive is the new drive, not the old right. drive. So uh, I hit F12, and when it comes up, that's I tell a pain. it to, uh, Windows 7. Yeah. Now, but when I went to uh, XP and I tried to do something, I don't see all of the all of my hard drives. Um, hmm. Could be that XP doesn't. Uh, maybe the hard drive's too big. XP could only handle, I think, two gig drives. Things like that. Well, it's, yeah, it's two. It's two terabytes. Yeah, it probably. <laughs> XP says there's no such thing as a two terabyte drive. What are you nuts? Oh, what are you okay. crazy? <laughs> That's all. I just can't see it because it's so. I love your show and uh, thanks. Good listening to you. So you can uh, f you can flip flop uh, the drives instead of having it be you know switch the. It, dep it depends on the computer. In some computers, flopping the connectors, uh, it will boot in order down the connector. So you just make it you know the boot drive be the uh, F drive by swapping the connectors. Sometimes so you can data, just do. That works like that. Uh, no, SATA does not. That's IDE. So if you're okay, so you have a fairly recent XP computer and you have SATA, you can do you could switch the boot order in the BIOS. Okay. All right. And just say, hey, start this drive, and you won't have to press the F12 and all of that. Okay, but if I want to go back to to uh, to, uh, I'll have to do that if I want to go to XP. Um, yeah. Well, you yes, exactly. You have a dual. You've created without your intention, but you did it very nicely. A what's called a dual boot machine that gives you the choice. Okay, I just want to make sure I did. That's a good idea. Now, you, because you got Windows 7 Pro, you also have XP emulation built into Windows 7 Pro. I haven't figured that out. How do you do that? <laughs> Unless you need it, I wouldn't. Okay. I wouldn't. Because that's why I have the XP. Now I can just go over to XP and use a program over there. Um, that's right. Yeah. But just don't go online with it. Right. Because it's after April 8th, XP is going to be unsupported, and uh, there will undoubtedly be... All sorts of exploits just floating on the internet, waiting for you, waiting for somebody with XP to sign on. Yeah, I, I, you counts. just made me think of that. I probably wouldn't have even thought of that because, you know, Ooh. even when we're off the computer, when we turn the computer on, we're, we don't think we're online. We're online. You have to physically go to your router and turn it off, right? Yeah, I mean, generally, look, uh, you run, if you're running Windows 7, you don't have to worry. If you've booted into Windows XP, I would disconnect, <laughs> physically disconnect it from the internet before you do that. Right, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, because uh, so so normally a bad guy has to get you to run software to corrupt your machine. He has to trick you, you know, give you a fake flash installer and you run it and it's not and it's, now you got malware. That's the normal course of events. Exploits like these that we're talking about, the whole point of them is to, to get stuff on your computer without your knowledge or running anything. Just kind of float in and do it. And, you don't know and, how many times I've missed uh, uh, inheritances. I've had millions of dollars. Of <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's one way. Just click here, and you will be a rich man. Uh, but but all but so that's one thing. And the I'll, there that's going on all the time. And if you're if you are, uh, I don't want to say dumb. If you're, you're trying to be nice. If you're um, if you're gullible. <laughs> if you're nice enough 
to uh, run those programs, you know, if you're a nice person, you're trusting enough to run those programs, you will get bit. But these, what will happen after April 8th is Microsoft's going to stop patching Windows XP. There are bad guys right now, I guarantee you, who have a little briefcase full of ways to get XP to do what they want. Exploits, we call them, because they exploit flaws in the operating system. They know these already. They don't want to release them into the wild because Microsoft will fix them. After April 8th, anything goes, boys. And furthermore, every time Microsoft patches other versions of Windows, like Windows 7, Vista, and 8, it is an announcement to the hacker community, because often these are flaws exist in XP as well, that maybe you should check this. So there are going to be, over the months to come, lots of new ways to get into your system by you just viewing a web page, for instance. So if you're, if you're not online, they can't do anything. But once you get online... Uh, usually just a computer sitting online is safe. But again, I can't promise that. If it's behind a router, you're probably okay because they'd have to hack the router and then hack you. But of course, we're learning a lot of routers, including Linksys routers, which are the most commonly purchased routers, have major security flaws in them, which will never be patched because it's hard to patch a router. Uh, and the companies just ignore it. So it isn't hard to imagine a scenario where your XP machine is just sitting online and suddenly the bad guy has control of it. And then what do they use it for? Well, they could try to steal stuff from you. Most likely, though, they use it as part of a zombie army. Like this attack against uh, that we were just talking about against WhatsApp. If it really was a DDoS, we don't know. It was down for a long time. Usually that means it was. Uh, if it was a DDoS attack, it was done by an army of computers just like that. Zombie computers. Their owners didn't know they were being used maliciously. Their owners probably didn't know they were infected. But they were, and they were waiting for commands from the bad guy. And generally the command is something on the order of attack this system. So, yeah, Michael, if you have XP, and anybody listening, if you have XP, either do as Michael did and upgrade to a newer version of Windows, which has continued to be supported by Microsoft, or get a new computer, or... Don't go online with your XP machine. You can put Linux on there. You can do something else as well. But but XP... Now, remember, antivirus companies are going to continue to... In fact, Microsoft even is going to continue to update its antivirus. But that's not really the issue. These, these holes are what's really scary because they allow a bad guy to attack you and you don't even know it. You might not even be on the computer in some of the worst cases. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls coming up right after the word from your local stations. No, I never use my Founders card. It's a silly thing, the Founders card. I sucker, got suckered into it. Hey, are you a yada, yada, yada. Yada, yada, yada. Founder of what? Oh, it, <laughs> it's a long story. Uh -oh, it's a, okay, it's a club <laughs> for entrepreneurs and founders. You have to get invited by another founder to get in the club. <sighs> and then they give you this nice metal card. And in theory... What you can do with it is uh, you get deals from companies because they want to reach, you know, those kind of people. You flounder. Because you're a flounder. You're a flounder. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you get free fish on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then they have events like, um, uh, oh, thank you. You made me a salad. You're such a nice fellow. Flounder thank you. dinner. See, here's my flounder card. So, um, in theory, you get special uh, benefits, like they have special events and stuff. Oh, and you it's say, lovely. Well, here's my founder's card. You can also cut meat with it. It's, it looks like it. Yeah. It's made out of high-grade industrial steel. But if you flash that at a restaurant or a bar, no one's impressed. They don't. They, they go, are, yeah. Is and that? is that your business card? Yeah. Because then I got, remember, I got this. This is actually more useful. I'm just waiting to use this. This is the business card Ooh. with the lock picks built in. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> huh? It's the Mitnick card, except it's some other guy. But, um, yeah, Kevin Mitnick used to hang these out. I, I feel like that's probably illegal. So I've been carrying my wallet waiting to get arrested. Because then I can they, they I think they're going to put me in a room and shine a light in my face and say, mm -hmm. and what were you doing with this? I, I, it's just somebody's card. I don't know. What is yeah. it? Well... Come on, kid. We're not that stupid, and you're not that stupid. You're the tech guy. You know what that is. 
No, I don't. It's just a kid. I don't know. I don't know. But he's got my mommy. Um, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it does. You can't get on an airplane with that thing. I have. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, though? I know what you're saying. <laughs> Fortunately, there's no locks to pick on an airplane. But you could stab a uh, stewardess in the eye with it. <gasps> Stop it. <laughs> you know, you're a, don't say that out loud. <laughs> the TSA is always listening. Let me put your name up just so they know who you what? are because no. it's not me. That's not me. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Where were you on the night of January 24th? Mm. Mm. Oh, God. <sighs> Come on. It's her, like, TSA. Oh, I'm no, you're not horrible. Lockpicks are legal in California. But if you commit a crime with them, says True, you get extra punishment. It's like having a gun. You can have a gun, but if you commit a crime with it, you're going to get more jail time. So the fact that they're still attached to the card, I think, probably makes it okay. Yeah, I like the spaghetti squash. squash. I should probably get a spaghetti squash. It tastes just like spaghetti. Not. <laughs> But I actually like spaghetti squash. Squash. Speak me. <laughs> now that's a salad. It's not a Caesar. I mean a, a chef's, but it's a salad. Look at that. John made me that. Isn't that beautiful? And I've completely liberally dosed it in balsamic to make it sweet and tasty. How do you make zucchini noodles? I've watched a YouTube video on how to use a lockpick. I think I'm prepared. The bump, bump uh, key. Uh, you know what? There is no ch uh, uh, chicken broth in my bolognese. I could have done that. I make Marcella Hazan's bolognese, which is a very simple bolognese. No croutons, no cheese. Mm. 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 Spanish noodles are just green noodles. <laughs> she hasn't been a small town Midwest girl in years. Don't let her give you that. She's an urbanite. It's both. Deep in your soul, the Iowa still hanging For out? For sure. Yeah. I just had this discussion last night. I let people in, in traffic. Me too. And I'm mad about it, though. So there's a little urbanite, and there's a, you know, like I, I, I flip them off, but I let them in. So it's a little bit of both. Oh. I absolutely go... <laughs> After you. After you, sir. You probably not would like problem. to get in this lane that I'm already in. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in a hurry. In my cute white BMW. Traffic is something that we all participate in. It's not a war. Ha! <laughs> Says the traffic former traffic. Why is it everybody makes it a war? You should see Lisa. Oh, no. <laughs> she swears... <laughs> I, I kind of get the same way too it's like you can't something not. you would never do if that person were there but because it's a car oh I have the foulest mouth when I'm driving you oh so you're lying then what you're not really the midwest girl you pretend to be no if someone's like struggling and obviously they're lost yeah no I, let, I, I let them in but the person that went across three lanes and cut in front of me yesterday got a mouthful I was in the parking garage here right <laughs> Uh -huh. And uh, somebody scraping your car onto think, the wall. Yeah, scraping my car. It looks like somebody's pulling out, so I pause, put on the blinker, and this big truck starts to go around me. Uh. Um, and then it turned out the person wasn't backing up, so I, I knew that the guy was there. I, I could have easily smashed into him because it's tight. <laughs> but um, I was paying attention. But the guy is like, "Come on, paying attention? On. That's not allowed." <laughs> fifteen seconds. You can't wait. Fifteen seconds. You got to go around me in that big old pickup truck. Come on. Yeah, big people rush are, on the weekend are, there, huh? A lot of people in a rush, in a hurry. Yeah. Big people in a hurry. 
I was Lisa and I were looking for some, an address in uh, Santa Rosa yesterday. And I was driving okay a, li a little slow at the at an intersection that wasn't a stop sign. And this little old lady in a little Honda behind me, the hippie girl, beep beep beep, move, hurry up! Move. It's like come on. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. Everybody settle down a little. Take a deep breath. I love you, Web nine eight eight one. Do really? Do you you don't even know him? I don't. Oh, that's funny, Jabba. I hate when the cousins in Iowa play the whole city mouse, country mouse thing. You're like, I was running around that farm and stepping in cow poop before you were born. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, cousins in Iowa. <laughs> well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk about computers, the internet, smartphones. All that jazz, 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number, 33 and 3rd after the hour. We will uh, talk to Chris Marquardt, our uh, digital photographer on digital photography. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the number if you want to get in line and get talking here. Uh, that's what Josh did in Cincinnati, Ohio, our next caller. Hi, Josh. Hi, Leo Laporte. How are you doing? I am very well. How are you? I'm doing not too bad. It's uh, about... About 40 degrees here, so it's a little chilly. Wow, that's springtime has hit uh, Ohio. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a heat wave around here. <laughs> <laughs> what can I do for you? Uh, I was wondering. Um, I, I between you and uh, and Kevin Smith, the director, I have uh, gotten to think and gotten it in my head that this year I want to start uh, podcasting. Yeah, Kevin does uh, Smod. Actually, he has a whole empire yeah. now, doesn't he? He's Smodcast. Yeah, he and I, I between you and between Twit and him, I. That's all my podcasting that I it's, can it's do. It's kind of interesting because um, he he was the silent guy in his movies. Yes, yes, indeed he was. Silent he, was he can ramble though. Jay and Silent Bob, right? Yeah, but on the podcast, the guy never shuts up. Exactly. So, <laughs> so I guess he had a lot stored up. Dichotomy. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's interesting that somebody as 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 uh, famous and successful would do podcasts as Kevin Smith would do podcasts. Mm -hmm. But I think what he likes. You know he's made enough money, right? What he's what right. he likes is the freedom that uh, the podcasting uh, allows. I don't like the word podcasting because yeah. we've gone way beyond putting this on an iPod. In fact, the iPod's dying. Even Apple, you know, acknowledges the iPod sales were cut in half this year. Uh, people put you know podcasts on other devices like their smartphones. What they are really is just downloadable audio from the internet or video uh, it can be as well that you can uh, watch at your convenience on other devices. It's really audio on demand or video on demand. That's what it is. Um, and we do everything I do. For instance, this show is available after the fact on demand audio and video. And uh, I have a whole network of stuff. So does Kevin Smith. How many shows does he have now? I am not sure. Uh, quite a bit. Yeah. Quite a bit. So I'm, I'm, I, I have, we have 30 on the Twit Network, but I bet you he's close. So it's, it's, close, a fun, yeah. it's a fun business uh, because it's democratic. You don't have to have radio towers or transmitters. Uh, all That's you need cool. is access to the internet, and uh, you have access to not just, you know, the people in your town or even the country, but all over the world. About a third of our listeners to this show and every show I do are outside the U.S. That's fantastic. Yeah. So you want to do what is the so the first thing when people say I want to do a podcast, first thing I say is don't expect to make money. It's a hobby. Right. Of course. <laughs> I doubt Kevin Smith makes it even makes any money, and he probably has millions of listeners. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, do it because you love it. The second thing I say is do whatever, you know, when you pick a topic for podcasting, uh, do something you love deeply, passionate. The more passionate you are about it, the better. For two reasons. One, because your passion communicates to your audience, and presumably you'll attract people who have a similar passion for that topic. If it's Pez dispensers, knitting, or dwarf pygmy goats, it doesn't matter. But <laughs> if you love pygmy goats... You, you know, you'll attract the other people who love pygmy goats, and then you've got a community. The other reason it's helpful to be passionate is because it, it's hard work, it's uh, and it can be a little discouraging after weeks and months, and you don't get any emails from anybody. And uh, it's nice to be doing something you really love, wh whether or not you get responses. So, what is the subject you'd like to cover? Um, well, I'm currently in film school. I'm about to graduate here in about six months, and so I really like uh, like watching TV shows, uh, movies, and so kind of like reviews and stuff. And then I'm also into 
technology, obviously, because I listen to almost every Twitch show. <laughs> Thank so, you. Wow, I want to talk about uh, <laughs> I want to talk about tech, the cool stuff, sound, and um, just just life, movies, and tech. There you go. I mean, the more diffuse it is, the more difficult it is to gain an audience because, of course, it's hard to you know you don't you don't have an elevator pitch. Um, yeah. You don't. You don't have that. But the more targeted it is, my experience, the better people understand what you're doing, and and the more likely you'll attract an audience. On the other hand, you okay. should be. You're doing it for fun. Now, film school is interesting. Do you want to do video? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm yeah. going for digital filmmaking, video production. Yeah. I, uh, I'm I, honestly, I don't really have a particular. Uh, uh, dream job. I just want to get into the industry and do something that I love. Well, this and, is the um, wonderful thing you know. about uh, the new media. And I'll, I'll, I won't say podcast. I'll say I'll just lump it all together, new media, you know, because that includes YouTube and it includes podcasting. It includes uh, people like me. I basically built an internet television and radio station, you know. that Exactly. So it, there's a lot of different ways to do it. So I'll call it all new media. But the nice thing about new media is... Uh, you know, in the old days, you graduate from film school. You you go around in Hollywood trying to get a job, trying to find somebody. You probably end up doing uh, films for companies or industrials. Or I have a a friend, a kid that uh, grew up. My a good friend of my son, um, his name is Spencer Wardwell, and he uh, he um, dropped out of college because he loves filmmaking. And of course, I'm sure he wants to make movies. But what he ended up right. doing is he found a um, he found a website. Um, uh, it's actually it's kind of interesting. A regional website about the South. Let me see if I can find the uh, the website. Uh, SocietySouth.com, and he's become their filmmaker. So there's a lot of it, one of the things that's happening is, uh, and this might be white, one way to kind of think about doing this is partnering up with somebody who needs uh, who needs your skills, who wants to become you know. So Society South, the idea is it's a uh, it's a website for people who live in the southeast, the modern southern experience. And they were smart. Not only is it a blog with text, but they do a lot of film. And it's so it's they probably could do a podcast too. So those are the kind of people you might want to hook up with somebody who's doing something you're interested in. Um, yeah. you know. Um, well, so anyway, you didn't you didn't, <laughs> what was your question? I guess I should ask that. Uh, I guess uh, how should I uh, get started? What what's some vital equipment that I should uh, I should get? Well, Okay, that's one of the reasons I asked audio or video. So audio is easy. You already have it probably. You right. have a computer, a laptop even, and uh, internet Thank access. You. Yeah. You can, if you want, get fancy, get out a better microphone. But that's about it. And, and you know, uh, if, if you really want to get fancy, there are podcast kits that include mixers and microphones and stuff. Right. Do you want to interview people like Kevin does, or do you want to just uh, do it yourself? Um, maybe eventually. Yeah. Uh, I, I just want to start out, just get my voice out there, really. Yeah. So you, you truthfully, a headset, an inexpensive headset will be fine. Um, there are companies like Rode, R-O-D-E, that make excellent yeah, USB. Those, yeah. yeah, they're great. Rode Podcaster mic is a great microphone. Uh, Blue also makes some USB mics. The Blue Yeti is a great yeah. mic. It depends on how much you want to spend, but no more than a couple hundred bucks. And then right. you've got a great setup, headphones, and you, you record. And frankly, if you're doing video, YouTube's the place to go. But uh, even with audio, there are places to go where you can post it. That's the big expense of uh, doing this is bandwidth. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but that's the nice thing about YouTube. I, if you add pictures, then you can put it on YouTube. <laughs> so maybe put some pictures yeah. in there. But that's where it gets complicated because now you got to get a camera. You probably already have one. You're a film student. I do. Yeah, I have a T3i. Oh, perfect. You know what's nice yeah. about these digital SLRs? They're four stills, but they do great video. And because do. you Especially can, with Magic Lantern. Yeah. So, okay, so you've got Final Cut. You've got Magic Lantern, which is a plug-in for mm -hmm. Final Cut. You've got a great camera. Well, you're set. And, and yeah. now I would use YouTube because it's free. Okay. The sure. only negative on YouTube is you're going to put they're going to put their own banner ads and sometimes even pre-roll ads on your stuff. Yeah. But uh age we live in. <laughs> hey, that's the, you know, it but everything is free and that's a huge expense. You know, we on our mm -hmm. podcast network uh we use a company called Cashfly. They uh they tell me we do 950 terabytes a month of downloads. That's wow. More than 30 terabytes a day. If I had that that's if you're just starting out <laughs> that's a fifty thousand dollar a month bill. You you don't. That's a lot. You, <laughs> but fortunately, you can build up slowly, and YouTube is, does it for free. If you could have that much on YouTube, and and they would give you money, they'd be so happy. Yeah. Right. Very true. Make a nice website. Make a nice website so people can find it. I'm looking at the Society South website. It's beautiful. Um, and you know, uh, these are just young people who set out. You know, they picked a topic, right? They said, mm -hmm. we want to cover a region. That's a great way. They've got Instagram. They've got Twitter. They've got videos. You know, 
You can do this or you can do it with some friends. You are in a great position. Getting out of film school today, I think you are in the best position ever to have a wonderful career because you don't need to go hat in hand to the money people. You don't need Steven Spielberg. You can do it yourself. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. And I think this is... It's funny. Uh, my son sent me a text saying, Hey, have you seen what Spencer's doing? It's really cool. They do uh, beautiful um, stuff. And he's doing this great video for them. I just think it's really neat. Really neat. I guess that's an ad, actually. That looks like it's an ad. Huh? Oh. So, well, it's too late, but I'll give you a plug. What's in, what's uh, should I just I'll mention it when we come back. Should, what's the website? Shotengine.com. Shotengine.com. Oh, that's right. You do. I forgot. <laughs> I should have mentioned that. Awesome. Oh, let me give you a big plug. That is great. That is great. What a neat idea. Do you do video as well or no, we're just audio? Just that because I've wrapped up with the YouTube Drive Network. And ah. We're, all that's wrapping up, so we're figuring right. out where to go right now. Yeah, I, I am, I, I'm skeptical about the whole YouTube model. Uh, it's failed. Uh, that's what I think. Everybody, you know, it all happens right around my house in L.A. And yeah. Everybody down there doing it, and it's failed across the board. Yeah, you work very, very hard for very little money. Everybody's lucky if they're breaking even right now. Right. I've been saying that, you know, and and a lot of our team says, well, we got to get on YouTube. We got to get those millions of views. And I say, but our model is just different. And we make money because we, we have a model. It's a different model. And, um, yeah. Yeah, and you guys can, I mean, you've got a big enough audience. You can just point your audience wherever and they'll go. Right. Well, we put everything we do on YouTube. Yeah. But, um it's for promotional purposes. We don't we don't attempt to, and we certainly don't make any money on it. Actually, I think it's like so Lisa was telling me it's a few thousand a month now, but we have put a lot of content up there, and it certainly doesn't pay for the content we put up there. Yeah. It's an it's incremental income. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, eighty eight eighty eight. Ask Leo. We're talking high tech. We're talking computers. We're talking the internet. We're talking uh, podcasting. It's actually kind of coincidental with our last call uh, because Chris Hayes is uh, sitting in the studio uh, right now. He's visiting. He runs a company called uh, Shout Engine, which is designed to uh, for podcasters, for audio podcasters, not video. Uh, you know, audio is so expensive. And you don't really want to compete with YouTube anyway. They, they're really got, they own that space. But if you're an audio podcaster, they host it. Do you help people monetize it or is it just... Uh, that's coming. In the next that's place. coming. He's, he's looking for startup uh, funding and... But they do a lot of the hard work, publishing, analytics, hosting for a podcaster, and uh, they do it for free, which is nice. If you get more bandwidth, it can cost, but I guess you're going to an all-free model at some point. So uh, for our last caller, this is interesting, shoutengine.com, uh, shoutengine.com. That's, that's fascinating. Good luck, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. This is, I'm, to me, it's very exciting. And, and, you know, when you have a new industry and... Or, or you're taking an existing model like print, radio, and TV and kind of reinventing it. There's, it's disruptive, and there's always dislocation. And there's, you know, newspapers that are failing right now. Um, there's, it's, it's, it's challenging for the people who are new to it, using these new models to make a living. A lot of, a lot of uh, kids getting out of school who want to write or uh, do video or audio. Can't, can't make a living doing it because it's just... But it's in the middle of a change. We're in the middle of this complete ferment. And this, you've seen this across the board. The internet disrupted almost everything. The last 20 years have been kind of nuts. If you're a travel agent, if if you're a cable company, I mean, everybody. So uh, this isn't this little slice of time isn't really a good way to judge it. I think in the long run, it's very exciting. It, it will democratize the media. Anybody will be able to uh, do a radio show, a TV show, write a book, write a blog, and you won't have to go to the publishers, to the radio stations, to the movie companies to do it. You'll be able to do it on your own, and that's fantastic. People say, but then there'll be so much stuff. Yes, there'll be a lot of stuff.
<laughs> That's not a bad thing. Well, how do I find the good stuff? Oh, you will, because we're also developing social media at the same time things like twitter and facebook that let people discover stuff so a friend finds something that's really good he tweets it or he puts it on facebook or she says hey you pinterest you got to try this and so there are new methods of, for getting the word out as well and i think they work quite well it's all in flux but i think that it's starting to gel we're starting to understand it making a living is challenging i understand and that's why i tell people when they say i want to do a podcast well do it but uh, don't expect to make money at it do it because you love it on the other hand, there are some, and I include myself in this, who've done quite well in podcasting. We've been, we've, we've found a niche, we've found an audience, and uh, have been able to make a living doing it. So it is possible. John in Melbourne Beach, Florida, you're next. Hi, John. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Hey, John. Um, I'm new. I'm new to your podcast. I haven't listened to it for that long. Mm, good. Well, welcome. It's nice to have you. Um, I have a question about. A Macintosh SE that was given to me. By wow, that's an that's computers older than you are. Yes, it is. Um, it has a lot. I've gone through three hard drives on it, and I have no idea why. And I want to find out where I can get more hard drives. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I don't think that. Uh, what? Uh, wow, that uh, Mac SE. Um, I think when it came out, what did it have, a 10 megabyte hard drive or 20 megabyte hard drive? 30 megabytes. 30 megabytes. And what are you putting on it? Um, uh, 30 megabytes and 40 megabytes. Oh, where are you finding those, on eBay? Uh, there's a local computer shop that sells old computer parts. Oh, that's cool. So that's probably why they're failing. They're 20 years old, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I would look on eBay. Uh, you're not gonna, you know, you're gonna have to get a drive that that Mac can use. Is it an ID? Right, I, is it an ID? It's SCSI, probably, isn't it? Yes, it is SCSI. SCSI, Small Computer Systems Interface. A um, couple of sites you ought to know about. EveryMac.com. That's a great place to go to see every Mac ever made and the capabilities thereof. And there are advertisers on there who are aiming at people like you who collect old Macs. There's also one called lowendmac.com that is designed for people who have old Macintoshes. I doubt I'd be doing anything useful on that. What do you do with your SE? Well, I just keep it around and do word processing and play those old Mac games. That Which is your favorite? Address. Dark Castle? You ever play that? Nope. Oh, that's my favorite old Mac game. I don't know where you'd find oh, a I copy of that, but... Wow. I have a copy of Mac Football, but that's about it. You might be able to, um, does it have an, it has an external SCSI port, doesn't it? Uh, yes, it does. You might be able to use a bigger, more modern drive with a SCSI interface. Um, the problem with using newer drives is how do I get the operating system onto it? Right. Right. That's, boy, you're a smart kid. You know, SCSI allows you to daisy chain. So you could have the operating system, a boot drive that is the 30 meg drive, uh, and then daisy chain a larger drive off of that, then install the operating system onto the larger drive, perhaps, from there. But how would I get it off the smaller drive onto the larger one? Well, do you have an operating system installer? Uh, no, I do not. So you've just been copying it? Yes. Well, try copying it. So you know that that SCSI, you can you can add, I think, up to eight different SCSI devices. The only key on that is the last device has to have a SCSI Terminator. Have you seen those little Terminator plugs you plug into the SCSI port? It's just a SCSI connector with a red X on it. Yeah, there you go. So you, you, this is, how old are you, John? 13. That's awesome. So this is a hobby. You do it for fun. Do you have a, a more modern computer? Yes, I have a MacBook Pro. Oh, all right. So you're just doing this because it's kind of cool. Yes. I love it. There, there, what you need to do is probably find a uh, a classic Mac user group or something like that online, and then you could find other people who are also getting their Macs, their Mac SEs. I'm just. When did that Mac SE come out? What year was that? Ninety. But it might have been 86, 87. I don't remember. I don't really know very much history about it, but 
Yeah, go to everymac.com. They have uh, all the details of every Macintosh ever made. Actually, we've just brought the site down. I think other people are doing that as well. 87, the chat room says, 1987. So it is a lot older than you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think this is a great hobby. A great hobby. Um, I, you know, where do you get more hard drives? I'm sure eBay would have more. There's some links on the chat room that say stuff about hard drives. That yeah. I see. This was an 8 megahertz, 68,000 processor. Uh, it looked like the old classic Mac, except it had a little bit different front. It had a megabyte or two, not gigabyte, of RAM and uh, floppy, 800K floppy disks and then the hard drive. Wow, what a great hobby. John, it's great to talk to you. Stay in touch. I love that. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, hey, I remember Multitracker, yeah. It's discontinued in 1989. Of course, it'll only run uh, System 7, probably. I don't know. Came with... Uh, came with 3.3. Yeah, the uh, most, most recent operating system will run is System 7.5.5. Huh? Thank you for oh, you're welcome. You're Are you getting some people visiting? Yeah, we, there was Good. A of awesome. Front page. Awesome. That's great. Held up to the traffic, no problem. Good. That we always. That's our. Is it? A, is it? It looks like it's running uh, uh, WordPress. Nope. All I, custom. custom wow. It's all Python. Hey. Oh, Python. Nice. Are you a Python programmer, or you have? Uh, I am everything. I work on everything. I love Python. You know. Um, WhatsApp is in Erlang. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why they scale so nicely. Yeah. Um, they hired a Russian guy on coderforhire.com for the first programming. Look, it's an angry bird. Hello there, Chris Marquardt. Me, angry bird? No, this is an angry bird. Oh, this one. I, 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 th oh, I thought I was supposed really to angry. fling myself. That's like a room. counterfeit. <laughs> this, is not, this is not a real angry bird. It's a hacky sack, but that's a counterfeit. This is not a Rovio approved Angry Bird. That's oh, just this a looks very, tr very real. <laughs> a generic Angry Bird. Absolutely. Where'd you find that? I, the floor out here. It's Ozzy's. I think it's Ozzy's probably. Yeah, it's an upset aviary, says Chris. <laughs> it does look angry. It does look angry. <laughs> it's a furious pigeon. Yeah, it's definitely a knockoff. This was a this is a big problem. Uh, Rovio, uh, it's actually talked about that 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 you know they can't really control all of the uh, knockoffs. I played every. How, wait how a would you? How would you? Wait a minute. I can buy Dark Castle on the App Store. This is too good to be true. Return to what Dark, is Dark Castle. What is Dark Castle? It's an old Mac game. <laughs> Oh yeah, before before the time uh, when I, I I think I switched in two thousand six. Oh yeah 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 yeah. Well before I'm, I'm one of those latecomers. It was black and white. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but look, they have for uh, ten dollars. Let's look at this here. Yeah, that's the game. It's in color now. Oh wow. Well, I I used to play text muds and this kind of stuff. So actually, I ran my own mud for a while. So I'm an old oh, gaming I love muds. Geek, an yeah. old text adventure a game, a multi-user dungeon. Yeah, this is this is the original game. Yeah, oh, I'm downloading. This it. is oh, this is advanced. This is this has like proper graphics in it. Yeah, they've updated it. It says yeah. they have the original uh, levels, all 30 original Dark Castle and Beyond Dark Castle levels, plus 50 new levels. But it's it's no good if it's not an ASCII. They've taken want, ten years, want, to, ten years to create this. I'm downloading it now. I want, I want little characters that are like little letters on your ASCII keyboard. <laughs> you are in a cave. Yeah, the church is north. <laughs> I spent so much time uh, on a time-shared CompuServe computer using a 300 baud modem. Oh uh, sure. Playing Colossal Cave, <laughs> the 351 point version. That was so Wonderful. much fun. Oh, man, was that fun. Wonderful. But Bazork is essentially the same thing. But it's, you know, 
Oh man, I'm excited about this. Thank you. Yeah, I, you. I I downloaded some some knockoff or some some redone com- a C64 game Commodore game that I love to play, and it turned out that in, in hindsight it looked better than it actually was. Oh yeah. So. Oh yeah. Going back and Prince of Persia, the new Prince of Persia has a level mm-hmm. of the old Prince of Persia in it, and you or no Pitfall. I'm sorry, has the old Pitfall in it, and it's so bad. <laughs> okay, hold on a sec. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, Chris Marquardt is the photo guy, joins us each and every week at this time to talk about digital photography, to do some digital photographic myth-busting. We were talking about old Macintosh computers before the break, and Chris, I think you got your first Mac when? Uh, 2007. Oh, so you don't count. Yeah. Seven I'm, years I'm a, ago, you don't count. Yes, I know. It doesn't count. It's, it was OS 10 all, all the time, so I didn't even have OS 9 experience. So. <laughs> yeah, I was just looking on everymac.com. This John's computer, this Mac SE, came out in 89. Uh, or 87 was discontinued in 89. It was uh, a uh, 8 megahertz, 68,000, 1 to 2 megs of RAM, if you were lucky, you had a 20 or 40 gig, 40 meg, sorry, no gigs here. <laughs> gig, we didn't know what gig meant in those days. Meg hard drive, dual floppies, 800K floppies. And for people who complain about computer prices, get this, started the base unit, $2,900, hmm. almost 3000 And that's when a dollar meant something, 1987. But that's... But that, but that's still the, the the price for a really good high end computer. I think the prices haven't changed that much. They just burn their cycles a bit faster these days. We always used to say that the computer you wanted uh, is uh, to always twenty five hundred bucks. But see, that's changed. So let me see. I'm going to say, uh, what did I say? Twenty nine hundred bucks. Twenty nine hundred bucks in uh, nineteen eighty seven converts to uh, what do you, you want to take a guess? Uh, five thousand. Six thousand dollars. <laughs> okay. Our mo- Six in current money, six thousand dollars for that Mac SE. That'll put some of that in perspective. How much is that in Bitcoin <laughs> <laughs> today or last week? <laughs> oh yeah, true. Yeah, Good great. question. <laughs> so Chris is uh, the author of a great Lightroom. I've been going through it. It's a wonderful Lightroom tutorial series called Discover Lightroom. You can get that at discoverlightroom.com. He also has a uh, short book version uh, thereof. He also does great... Of the f- workflow, yep. Yeah, the workflow, which is the key. 1,000 1, pictures in one hour. We were talking uh, last hour about backing up photos and workflow and how... It's yes. Backing up or, or making sure those photos are protected is part of the workflow. You know, part totally, of the workflow absolutely. is going through the pictures you took, getting rid of the ones you don't want, but a lot of it is just making sure that you can get them again and you've put them somewhere. And you're doing the right thing, leaving those pictures on the card until you use it next and, and cycle the, the cards. So, so the... The oldest card that you have still has pictures from maybe weeks or months ago. Yeah. So in case you in, in case you miss a backup or something goes wrong, you can still go back. That has saved me because I've it's back. so oh, yes. more, mostly what happens to me is accidental deletion, where I go I just <clears throat> oh, delete a whole folder and I go oh wow. And especially when I travel, I, I, I now treat yeah. my cards like film. I right. fill them up and then I put them away. Right. And, and when I get home, I import them. I might do a backup on the road, but I'm not reusing cards on the road. They're I'm cheap just, now. I fill and them up. Yes. I don't get... Now, you yeah. tell me if I'm wrong on this one. I, I, you can get 64 gigabyte uh, SD cards now, even better, 128 gigabyte. Sure. But I do 32 gigs and nothing bigger. Because I don't mm-hmm. want to rely too much on any one card, right? <laughs> you know, if if you have a big new camera, those those more high end ca- cameras, they have two slots, and what you can do is you, you you can fill both of those slots with like a 64 gigabyte card, and then have the camera write to both at the same time, so you have a backup oh, built into clever. the camera. Yeah. But um, if you have a smaller camera, yeah, I'm, I'm I don't like to put too many eggs into one basket so i'm looking at 8 to 16 gigabytes that's kind of where i feel comfortable because then there are not too many pictures on a card in case it fails but to be honest i haven't really seen too many cards fail so um there's a bit of a bit of a, a hygiene thing uh when you when you take your camera and you take the card out if you open that card door wait for a second or two before you actually pull the card out. Some what? cameras will write for another second oh. once you open the door. And when the camera is in the process of writing and you pull the card out in the middle of that, you might corrupt the card. So give it a second or two. Just yeah. Be patient. Take take one breath and then take the card Something out. Something many of us geeks are not good at. Patience. I know. Yeah. 
So what do you want to talk about today? Or <laughs> you have a myth you want to bust? Or? Well, it's a, it's a myth. Uh, we, we did talk about moon photography uh, a while ago when there was this super moon. I'm making big air quotes here. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, And people still say, yeah, you can just point the camera at the moon and shoot it. Now, at this very moment, right now, we have a waning moon that is about 50% lit. So I thought we, we, we talk about moon photography again because this is actually a good time to take pictures of the moon. If you take pictures of the full moon, all you get is like a grayish surface with a, a bit of detail in it. But as soon as the light comes from the side, it's the same as in, in reality when you look around you. If you shoot with the light coming straight at someone, you don't get much depth and, and many shadows. If you have the light coming from the side, all of a sudden you have all the textures coming out. And the same happens with the moon when it's at, at about 50%. The light is coming straight from the side. And that means that at this boundary of the bright and the dark side of the moon, you will see the craters come out really nicely. And if you have, let's say, a 500 millimeter lens, 600 millimeters, that's when it kind of starts to get interesting on a, on a DSLR when you can take really cool moon photos that really show a lot of detail. I, I love pictures of the moon, but you need a pretty long lens to get it uh, right. Well, yeah. unless you want, yeah, I, w I wouldn't. I wouldn't go below six hundred. If you want to fill, <laughs> who has fill a six hundred millimeter lens? Well, come there, on, there are three hundred millimeter lenses and extenders. Some people do that, especially people who love to shoot wildlife and these kind of things. Yeah. That's uh, something that they would typically have, or borrow one, um, get one from a friend for for a few days. What the, the interesting thing is, you don't really need like. 1500 millimeters because I mean yes that will fill the screen but today's cameras first of all they have so many megapixels so it's easy to crop the second thing is um, if you put something interesting in the foreground if the moon is really low above the horizon if you put something interesting in the foreground that will make for a more interesting picture with uh, with let's say a few trees around the moon or something that gives you a bit more detail not just the moon because yeah well, there are millions of those pictures but if you include something interesting you will have more interesting pictures i always pictures. thought those were fake <laughs> the giant moon pictures uh, this one doesn't really look that real. <laughs> but yeah actually it might be true i mean giant moon means long focal length so this is a picture the one that you just showed is probably a thousand i just did a google more. search for a giant moon um i don't know i mean you this is the problem with photoshop nowadays you can't really tell if somebody's faking it or not i i feel like these are kind of fake but it is true the moon i don't think it's fake the moon the, the will one, look one, bigger one. It, yes. That's probably real. This is a moon rising over uh, uh, some buildings. It will well, look bigger. The moon bigger. will look bigger over the right. horizon, right, right right above the horizon. It will look bigger, but it is not actually bigger. The moon is actually just, uh, in size, it's just half a degree. So right. it's really, really tiny. And right. so you will need a long focal length. And you will need to do some manual exposure, which is not that difficult, actually. There's a rule, a rule of thumb. So your camera's automatic exposure will fool you there. It will, will get it wrong. But there is, there, have you heard of the sunny 16 rule? No, what's that? Well, it's it's an exposure rule. So if if, if with old cameras they didn't have expo, they didn't have light meters built in. So what you would do is you would set the camera to the inverse of the ISO. So if you shoot at ISO 100, you shoot at a one hundredth of a second, and the sunny 16 rule means shoot with that shutter speed at f16 at the aperture of f16 okay and then you have well exposed pictures in sunlight there's another rule that's called the loony eight so if you shoot the moon set your camera again the shutter speed to the inverse of your iso so if you shoot at iso 400 yeah. set it to a 400th of a second okay and use f8 and you will have a decent exposure well, these of the are moon. nice rules of thumb doesn't the and camera do that automatically though for you the problem is that the camera, with the moon being this small, it only it pretty much only sees know the what's black sky. It right, doesn't really know right. what's going on. It's not really programmed for that. So it will it will probably overexpose it, and then you end up with the moon being completely overexposed. And overexposure yeah. means there is no detail. It's just in the moon. A, a you white don't get dot. the craters. Yeah, it's a white dot. There's no craters in it, but that's what you want. So, Chris uh, Marquardt, discover the top floor dot com. We will uh, discover Lightroom dot com too for his workshop. We'll talk about our assignment when we come back. Thank you, Chris. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Anything else you want me to plug? Before? We kind of, I kind of sidetracked you, and I apologize. I'm sorry. It's okay. I didn't hear the music, so... I, I can you not hear... Owner. I, can I didn't you, hear it. Can you hear me talking now? Yes, I paper. can. Okay, good.
Okay. It's so anyway, I didn't hear that bit. No, don't worry about um, it. Well, if you if you could if you could, if you could do a little plug for the one hour one thousand pictures. Okay. Thing that's at one hour one thousand pics dot com. One hour one thousand pics dot com. You got that's it. That's the the ebook. You got it, Pubola. One hour. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. We'll talk to you next week. I will be gone next week. <laughs> um, I'm going to send you an. Well, I, I'll try. I'll see. I'll, I'll be in Iceland next week. Um, oh, how fun! It's gonna be fun, and I might be able to get. A, well, let's see how the, the internet connection from the hotel is. If that's any decent, I will be there. But don't count on me. Cool. Well, we'll we'll we'll. Keep I'll do it. my best. It's fine if you don't. It's fine if yes. you don't. I'll, All right, I'll do Chris. my best. If I'm if I'm if I'm on, I will be doing a review. Good. And I will plug one hour, 1,000 P-I-C-S. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Good. Thanks, Chris. See ya. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Hey, our show today brought to you by sharefile.com. I'll tell you, when I, um, when I uh, because of the radio show, I'm constantly sharing audio files with radio stations all over the country. Uh, if you're in business, in fact, I would imagine that most business emails have an attachment of some kind or other. My recommendation, you've heard me say it over and over again, don't send attachments. It's dangerous for a lot of reasons. Uh, Lisa just sent me, uh, I got I to gotta get her on ShareFile, just sent me an email that had, it was a CC, but she sent me, uh, she sent her account an email that had tax forms on it and stuff. We're doing our taxes. It bounced back. Happens all the time uh, because it was too big. Uh, of course, the other thing, and I, I've got to explain this, is when you send this stuff through the mail, through the email, it's it's public. Anybody along the way can read it. And that's, you know, you're sending tax forms. Eh, I wouldn't do that. If you're in the, you know, you're a physician, you can't send patient records that way. It's it's actually illegal. Violates HIPAA. ShareFile is HIPAA compliant. It's secure. You control the files. You control who can see them, for how long. You never get a bounce back. Because you're not sending the file as an attachment. You're sending a, a secure link. Now, if you're using Outlook, their plugin makes it look just like you're emailing the files, but you're not. It's a secure link. You uh, have a folder. I have a ShareFile folder. Actually, I have several on uh, this computer that automatically sync to ShareFile. So let me log into my ShareFile account, and I'll show you. So what I do is um, logging in. First of all, notice it's branded. It looks it's a it looks like a Twit page. You know, and down here, little print it says "Powered by ShareFile." These are files uh, that I automatically synchronize from my desktop. Uh, they go out to the radio station. These are ads for uh, this week. There was only one that I sent to the radio station. Now watch how I do it. Um, they actually get a notification when I upload a file. I've set it up so they get a notification. You can set that up here down, low, down below in the permissions. And so I don't even have to send them an email anymore. When they see a new file's in there, they just download it. But I'll show you what it looks like. So I'm gonna send this file and you can either, this is with the web interface. Like I said, with Outlook, it's just like using Outlook. Um, I can send an email this way, but usually what I do is I say, give me a link that I can send. And here's the parameters you can control, which is really nice. I can have it email me when the item's been downloaded. I can require name and email before downloading. I can control access, anything from, <laughs> it never expires to expires after a day. I can have how many downloads per uh, user. So they can download it once for one day, and that's it, for instance. Now, when I click Send File, I'm going to get a link, which I can then just copy to the clipboard. And I'll tell you what, I'll paste it in, because what I do is I email it to them, saying, hey, thanks, here's your, here's the ads, because I, you know, I like to be friendly. Have a nice weekend. They click that link in the email, and it pulls them to this branded site, and it couldn't be easier. Do they have to sign up for ShareFile? No. They know exactly what they're going to get, a WAV file this big with this name. They press the download button, and they've got it. It could not be easier. If it's a folder, it'll zip the folder up into one, one download. ShareFile really is the way to share files in business. In fact, if you go to sharefile.com right now, up at the top of the page, there's a free trial waiting for you. You have to click. There's several free trials on the page. I realize this is confusing, and I apologize, but go to the link at the very top of the page at sharefile.com where it says, you know, you hear about this on a podcast. That's right, you did. You heard about it on the Tech Guy podcast. So click that link. Podcast li listeners, click here. And you can get a 30-day free trial. When they ask you, 
use the if you would use the offer code tech guy so they know you heard it on our tech guy show but also choose your industry you'll see it's customizable for biotech legal publishing recruiting software tech services video medical of course and more they'll customize it and uh it will be designed for that business sharefile.com click the link at the top of the page heard it on a podcast use the offer code tech guy try it free for 30 days you will never ever share files any other way again leo laporte the tech guy don't forget chris marquardt's one hour 1000 pictures supercharge your uh, workflow in lightroom you can uh, try it at uh, the number one hour h-o-u-r the number 1000 pics p-i-c-s dot com or just go to discover the topfloor.com that's chris's site and you'll have links to all of his work we do have an assignment if you're you know interested in getting better at uh, photography chris gives us an assignment every month it's not a contest it's a, it's just a excuse to take pictures frankly we're asking you to illustrate the word the concept the idea three notice i didn't say the number i don't know what it means you have to figure that out three and the way it works is uh, take a picture. Take a lot of pictures. You can use your smartphone. You don't have to you have a fancy camera or anything. Upload those. Find the pictures you like best. Tag them with the word three at Flickr.com. If you don't have a, a Flickr account, it's free. And uh, there is a group on there, the Tech Guy group. Go to the Tech Guy group. You'll see 10,000 members and many thousands of pictures. That's, that's the right group. Um, and Renee Silverman's our moderator. That's another way to know. And uh, join that group. It's free again to do that. And you upload your picture once a week. You get another picture. So a total of four. Chris is going to pick the three he likes the best. And we'll talk about them on a later show. Just for fun. No prizes. Flickr.com. Tech Guy Group. We're illustrating the word or concept three. Leo Laporte, the uh, tech guy. Ed is in Missoula, Montana. Hi, Ed. Leo Laporte here. Hi, Leo. Um, got kind of a weird question. I was wondering if you could decrypt this. Netflix Comcast agreement and its implications on other carriers. Boy, I'm glad you asked. I've been meaning to talk about this. Okay. Uh, today, uh, Netflix and Comcast announced that they had made an agreement that Netflix would pay Comcast for better access to the Comcast network. This is something Netflix had been looking for for some time. Netflix currently uses... so. Netflix, as you probably all know, uh, started as DVD by mail, but really their business these days is streaming movies. And it is simply the most popular streaming movie site on the net in the United States. About 40% of all internet traffic in prime time is Netflix. And, uh, I, and I include myself. I was watching House of Cards last night, which is their Netflix original. It's a fantastic, creepy series, and I love it. And I consume it three shows at a time. And so what a lot of people have noticed, especially in prime time, is that it's very uh, slow. Some have said Comcast is intentionally slowing down Netflix. Remember, Comcast, the nation's largest Internet service provider, also has its own streaming movie service, Stream Picks. So Netflix is a competitor. It's a little hard to parse what happened here, frankly. Um, it's, in my opinion... Comcast has been intentionally slowing down Netflix and, in a sense, uh, in my opinion, blackmailing them. If you want to reach our customers at a, recent, as a decent speed, you're going to have to give us more money. Uh, one of the ways Netflix would speed this up is by having uh, a relationship with Comcast where the movies come straight from Netflix servers into Comcast's data centers. In fact, Netflix wanted to put the servers inside Comcast's data centers. Net Comcast de declined to do that. But they will connect to Netflix servers at the data centers owned by Cogent and other companies. So it's what we call a peering relationship where Comcast and Netflix have a tighter connection than just the open Internet. That means data streams faster into Comcast servers. In my opinion, Comcast is double dipping here. They, you pay them. I pay them. Anybody who uses them pays them for free access, free and open access to the Internet. I pay them a lot of money. Um, and I expect to be able to access every corner of the Internet equally. Uh, what uh, Comcast says is, well, yeah, but Netflix uses up a lot of bandwidth. But the next step is to go to YouTube and others and maybe even me. I stream a lot of video to people's homes and say, if, if you would like full and free access to our customers, you must give us some extra money. 
<laughs> and I feel like that isn't what the internet is about. Now, the argument is more is a little more complicated than that because Netflix isn't using the free internet backbones, the, the open internet backbones. They want a special relationship with Comcast. So Comcast, perhaps reasonably, there's a bit of an argument, uh, it says, well, if you want that kind of relationship, you've got to pay us. Um, according to Netflix, they had seen a severe decline in streaming speeds to Comcast since uh, last October. Um, according to Netflix data published in January last month, the average speed had declined 27% since October. And I bet, uh, now that could be because Netflix is more popular, but my suspicion is it's because Comcast is artificially uh, strangling them. And I have to say, if you have a Comcast account, which I do, Netflix can be terrible, terrible on Comcast. Everything else is fine. What about outside that Comcast ecosystem? For this entire winter, I use, I'm a charter customer, just I, uh, just, uh, I, I'm a cord cutter. I don't have cable TV. And I've noticed on charter, same thing. This entire winter, my Netflix has been lousy. So I'm wondering what the bigger implications well, it's are. Well, it's kind of hard for us to know exactly what's going on. Now, I have an opinion, but the problem is, uh, a lot of this is obscured by both companies. They, Netflix doesn't, I think, want to irritate Comcast, and Comcast certainly doesn't want to be accused of, a po you know, being a, an internet uh, b bully. Um, Time Warner, uh, AT and T, and Verizon all have refused to connect with Netflix's servers without getting paid. So to me, what this does is it balkanizes the Internet. This is exactly what the Internet, sh this is what we were worried about with net neutrality. It's the people who can afford to pay the big Internet service providers extra for access to their better access to the customers will. And those of us, and I include myself because my business is a streaming video business, who can't will have poor access. Now, we have yet to, to it, it, this, it, well, time will tell if Comcast starts to throttle me to my customers and maybe they are it's hard to tell um and 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 if they ever come to me and say here we want money then we'll know mm. they're they're being uh pirates of a, of a different kind mm. um it's but it's complicated it's not as straightforward as it as it might see yeah. um and i i don't think netflix had any choice but what it does is it really is sets a precedent for other companies, you can bet Comcast is going to go hat in hand to these other companies. Say, hey, Netflix paid us. You should pay us. Um, and I don't think that's right, frankly. Yeah. Thank you, Leo. You're, you're, I'm so glad you called because I think it's a, a complicated question. Um, and, it's, and, it, and it really speaks to, I believe, a free and open Internet, which we all want. And it's what powers innovation in this country. Uh, the fact that a, co a company like WhatsApp can get access to everybody who has Internet access all over the world equally uh, without having to pay the gatekeepers, the Internet service providers, extra money. That's what made WhatsApp succeed. And it would kill small companies that are starting up if they had to pay for access to customers. We already pay our Internet service providers for access to the open Internet. That should be sufficient. Uh, and it, so it worries me. It really worries me. Now, unfortunately, the chairman of the FCC is a former cable company lobbyist. He worked for these companies. So I don't expect the FCC to weigh in with any vigor. In fact, they've already decided they're not going to contest uh, this uh, court case that they lost that said they don't have the right to uh, insist on Internet neutrality. This is what this is. This is what net neutrality is all about. So uh, it's a little it's a little d disappointing to me. It is more complicated because it is not a kind of a standard internet relationship that Comcast and Netflix have. They have what's called a peering relationship. Uh, that's a little bit different, and it and, and perhaps there are some economic reasons why Comcast might want to get paid for a peering relationship. But I just worry that a free and open internet is so important to the growth, to innovation, to everything that we love about technology today. That if we allow these big companies to start to hijack the highway, put toll roads in effect on the uh, highway system, that we'll lose this thing that is so precious to all of us. Traditionally, peering, I, we've got to get an expert on this. 
So traditionally, the way peering relationships work um, is because I send you a lot of traffic and you send me a lot of traffic, we agree to have a direct connect with one another. And in general, a peering relationship is, is equal. So uh, let's say America Online makes a peering relationship with YouTube. Um, and and it's, a, it's an equal relationship in the sense that data flows freely and it's roughly equal in both directions. Um, that's, the, that's the traditional peering relationship and that is an equal relationship. Comcast's point is, well, nobody's uploading to Netflix. Nobody, we're not putting anything on Netflix. It's all coming down from Netflix. So it's not an equal peering, peering relationship. It's an unequal relationship. So what you're asking is... Uh, for special treatment, and for that special treatment, we want to be paid. I think it's reasonable to say we want to be paid whatever extra it costs us, but I don't think that's what's happening. I think Comcast is saying, no, no there's a chance to make a little extra moolah. And because we're the largest internet provider in the country, and soon to become larger with the acquisition of Time Warner Cable, we can say a lot of moolah because otherwise... It's more than, what is 40 million, it will, it's currently 30 million, will be 40 million customers you don't have access to, or for whom Netflix is crappy. And those customers don't blame Comcast, they don't switch internet service providers, they can't, it's a monopoly. They just quit Netflix and they go somewhere else. So I don't think, uh, I really don't think Com Netflix has a choice in this matter. And I think Comcast is already well paid by us its customers for access to not just Netflix, but YouTube and everything else. But it is technically complicated, so I need somebody. You know what you need to get is uh, Jay uh, Adelson. I, uh, I used to work for Networks. Okay. What do you think? It's uh, what it is. I mean, generally, all the, all the peering agreements we had... I mean, They're it was mutual. Fairly, it was a fairly equal trade of right. traffic, so... And then, but once, you, once you acquire the hardware... There's no additional cost. It's a direct connect. Right. So you buy. So it would be reasonable for Comcast to say, well, we, we have to buy some special interconnect software so we can connect to Cogent and have a direct connection. Pay us for that. But at that point, there's no additional cost. And it makes Comcast more desirable. Because many ISPs, DSL Extreme does this. They will run gaming servers, for instance, in their, in their NOC because it makes them more desirable to gamers because the servers are in the NOC. Peering is good for the ISP, uh, and I don't think it's unreasonable to say as an ISP, oh, well, it's going to cost us a lot of money to put these, you know, servers in Cogent. We're starting to see some uh, Amazon throttling now, too. Some yeah, well, that's what they're going to do. And if they're allowed to get away with this, they're going to go, hey, it worked. And they're going to throttle Amazon? Of course they are. And Amazon will have to pay them. And they're going to throttle, uh, you know, everybody they can. Now, the good news is for us, for Twit, we just go over the public internet. We don't have a peering relationship with anybody. You know, we don't use Cogent. We just, well, actually, though, you know what? It would affect us because we use Ustream, Justin, and BitGravity, all three of whom will be approached at some point by these ISPs. Cashfly has peering agreements, you bet. Downloads, I'm not so worried about because if it's a little slow on a download, it's the streaming that's the real issue. <sighs> And Wheeler has said, Wheeler's decided we are not going to declare these guys common carriers. They, they gave up. <sighs> I don't know if Amazon and Google are already paying. I don't know. Code, this whole thing started with Cogent because Cogent said, I, we, we will not pay for these peering relationships. This is the article from the Wall Street Journal. Netflix has little room to pay more to transmit its movies and TV shows. In a February regulatory filing, Netflix said if providers don't interconnect with its servers, its ability to deliver streaming video, its business and operating results could be adversely affected due to increased costs. But the other side of that is Netflix is sending a lot of bandwidth to a lot of people. And the ISPs say, look, we, you know, we have to peer with you to provide this service for our customers. Depends how much, I guess. I think the biggest smoking gun, though, is that they're turning down the caching endpoints that right. Netflix will provide them. Right. 
they're, they're they're squeezing them, and then they get paid, and they say, well, well this is just fair. But you, but the, but the to get paid, you intentionally cut the bandwidth twenty seven percent. That's wrong. You know, there's no reason why it would suddenly. And since October, go down 27%, except that we know, anybody who's on a Comcast subscription knows, they've been, they've been turning the knob. <sighs> yeah, Verizon does it, absolutely. Everybody does it. Comcast made an agreement when it acquired NBC Universal not to do this. But in order for this to work, the FCC has to enforce it. Whoops. Right. Yeah, it's all government subsidized. All those fiber, all that backbone. Uh. And Skype, what where where to me it's a smoking gun is where the company like Comcast is in that business. So Comcast is in the VoIP business, they're in the streaming video business. So uh, they're gonna they're gonna uh, particularly be hard on those companies for anti-competitive reasons. So because UPS charges one end or the other, it would be like UPS charging both ends for delivery. So somebody says, like UPS, you pay more pounds. Well, the sender pays on UPS or the recipient pays, but not both. It's like UPS getting paid by both the sender and the recipient. UPS saying, I have a package for you from Amazon. If you would like it, you will give me a dollar. <laughs> that would be wrong. So there's, there's the analogy. And actually, that's a pretty good analogy. I might use that. Right, right. That's a good example. Yeah. Uh, Chris says um, it's like a cab driver asking the restaurant for payment when he delivers a fare. I delivered him here. You should give me a buck. Makes me cry. But it is the FCC created this. They created the duopoly many years ago. They said in almost every market in the United States, there are two ways to get internet, phone company or cable company, and that's it. And we get, you, got, you got wireless. <laughs> hmm. There are lots of people defending Comcast. Well, there's this one guy. A5 was in there. I think the toll road is a big is a good one. I can't because if I cancel Comcast, I don't have internet. This is how they have you. They're a monopoly. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the Tech Guy, Hour 3 of the Tech Guy program. We're talking about tech. Sure, that's computers and the internet and digital photography and home theater, but it also can be things like Comcast and Netflix. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the number, 888-827-5536. The website, and you really, jot this one down, because this is the, all you really need to remember is techguylabs.com, the Tech Guys Laboratory, techguylabs.com, because we put every link I mention, every story I talk about, we put up there on the website. Audio and video from each of the programs is offered on the website as well. So you can go back and you can say, hey, on last week's show, Leo answered a question about Dell computers. Let me go and listen to the answer in the question. There'll be a, a text as well, just synopsizing it. Links to any sites and things I mentioned. And then you can also comment on it, too. So the idea, and it's always free. We don't charge for it. Uh, never will, I promise you. Uh, the idea is this is a valuable resource that you can search and, and find what you need. Techguylabs.com. You don't need to write anything down while you're listening. Just visit the website. Also links there to our great chat room and our phone number and, and everything else. Techguylabs.com. We were talking about this Netflix thing, and uh, it's a little more complicated than Comcast simply saying, if you were, if you were to want to uh, deliver movies to my customers, you should, it should, you should give me some money. 
It's a little more complicated than that because they want to establish a special relationship. Netflix wants to establish a special relationship. So for But to me, this is what Comcast should be doing because it's good for its customers. And goodness knows Comcast charges us a lot. The cost of Internet on Comcast has risen steadily year after year after year to the point, you know, Comcast realized, as did all the cable companies, that at some point you weren't going to buy HBO and Showtime and local news and all of that stuff. You're just going to watch it on the Internet, and they know that. So what they've done is they've gradually increased the cost of Internet so that the difference between paying for a cable subscription and Internet is awfully close to paying for the Internet alone. Ten bucks more in most cases. So for ten bucks, you'll get the cable subscription. They're smart. And now they've found another revenue source. And if you're Netflix or Amazon, if you're Google or YouTube, and you want to reach our customers in a reasonable speed so that they can watch streaming video, you're going to pay us too. It's not unprecedented, but it's not... I, it, it's, it's, and the point is that Comcast is a monopoly. You don't have another choice. In most areas, you have two choices for Internet. Your phone company, your cable company. That's it. And, uh, and cable is almost always faster. So if you want high, the highest speed Internet in your area, it's almost always going to be your cable company. It isn't, it isn't a very competitive environment. If it were, we wouldn't have this problem. Because somebody would come along and say, well, forget Comcast. I'm going to offer you high-speed Internet, full access to Netflix. Netflix is going to look great. That would be a selling point, wouldn't it? That would make you a customer. But Comcast knows they've got you locked in so they can do anything they want. If they want to slow Netflix down by 27%, they can. And what are you going to do about it? Hey, what are you going to do about it? We're Comcast. <laughs> you don't like it? Go somewhere else. Worst company in America. I'm telling you, the more we learn, the more depressing it is. Terrible customer service, terrible service in general, and now they're hijacking and holding up these other companies that are giving or the reason we get Internet access because they compete with Comcast's own streaming service. And they get away with it because the FCC has no guts. It's run by a guy who was a cable company lobbyist. That should tell you something. Members of Congress don't care because they get nice big fat checks from Comcast and other cable companies. They're fine. It's us, the users. That's the ones who uh, suffer. And they're all doing the same thing, by the way. It's not just Comcast. They're all doing the same thing. <sighs> we got, you know, I, I think that the solution, we've got to find a way to make the Internet what it really is supposed to be, which is free and open access to the information of the world without gatekeepers without companies extorting us, holding us up for ransom. There's got to be a way. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Jeff is in Simi Valley. You're our next caller. Hi, Jeff. Well, Mr. Laporte. Yes, sir. Mr. I'm 100% Jeff. in agreement with you on Com Comcast. Worst company in America. Oh, I know. I know. Oh, and, uh, you know, I, I despair because I don't think there's a whole lot we can do about it. Oh, uh, boy, you, you have to wait and see. I hope not. They own our government. They uh, own the FCC. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I don't yeah. know what to do. Yeah, they're big, uh, they're big lobbyists there. Yep. Yep. Anyway, Leo, I have a seven-year-old computer with uh, XP on it now, and I listen to your show, and I know they're phasing out the support for that. Uh and I, I, want, I, I need your opinion on a couple of things. I'm looking for a new laptop. Okay. And uh, there's a lot on the market with 8.0 8 Windows and 8.1. Yeah, well, 8.1 is the current version. Even if you buy an 8.0 computer, it will automatically update to 8.1 immediately. Oh, it will? Yeah. It's okay. a free update. The price for 8.1, is it? It doesn't matter. It's a free over-the-air update that they do uh, almost you know, automatically. Oh, I see. And 8.1 is a nice improvement. It's a it's a big improvement, so you, you do want to do it. Now, you like uh, Windows 7 a lot better, right? Well, okay, so here's the deal. Windows 7's user interface, to me, is better because it's not a hybrid of a touch interface and a desktop interface. Microsoft decided after it released Windows 7 that the future of computing was moving towards tablet and touch computing. They didn't want to be left behind with what is essentially a mouse-based and a keyboard-based system. So they 
created a touch-based system and glommed it on top of their mouse and keyboard-based system. So it's a oh, I it's see. kind of a weird hybrid. And I find that's confusing for people. For instance, there's two different Internet Explorers. There's two different versions of the browser, one for touch, one for mouse. And it's unpredictable which one you're you're going to be using. And to top it off, they have different user interfaces. So this is a bad this is bad interface design. Oh, however, <laughs> uh, well, but th but that I'm not done because however, Windows 8 improves in many ways the underlying code. It's more secure, it's faster. It fixes bro the broken file copy system that's been a problem in Windows since day one. So it, there are a lot of things that are better about 8. And what's happened is that Microsoft has realized no business is going to buy Windows 8 because they have to retrain their employees it's too expensive so businesses are buying windows 7 so microsoft with 8.1 and with the next version the update one which will be coming out soon is making it more and more like 7. today i would buy 8 just because it's the state of the art that's the reason leo laporte the tech guy february 20th article in uh, the new york times yesterday talking about comcast's web of lobbying and philanthropy um uh, Immediately after Comcast announced its plans to spend $45 billion to merge with Time Warner Cable, uh, its tame lobbying groups started to beat the drum. The United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Win-win situation for America businesses. Uh, but of course, what they didn't mention is that they have collected at least $320,000 over the last five years from Comcast's charitable foundation. Comcast has more than 100 lobbyists registered in Washington, D.C. alone. 100. Five former members of Congress. Former FCC Commissioner Meredith Atwell Baker. <laughs> uh, this is... Now you understand why Comcast gets away with stuff like this. They spend a lot of money. They've got we've got the finest Congress money can buy. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight to ask Leo. That's the phone number. We were talking about Windows Eight uh, with Jeff, and he was reluctant. I understand he's getting a new computer, reluctant to get Windows Eight. I think that if it, now you don't want to get in that same situation, Jeff, in a few years where they're discontinuing uh, Windows Seven, you might as well get the current operating system. And I okay. do, I do feel like Microsoft's making it easier and easier to ignore the touch interface. And use the desktop. Okay. So I, I think at this point, it, we, we don't have much choice. You, there are companies, lots of them, still selling Windows 7. That, that will end on Halloween, by the way. Microsoft has decreed that HP, Dell, and others, who, Lenovo, still sell Windows 7 computers, will stop doing so. They must stop doing so October 31st of this year. I see. But uh, again, I you know, Windows 8, uh, by the way, in update one of Windows 8.1, which is due out probably June, May or June, that's going to bring the desktop back. You can boot to the desktop. It's going to bring the start menu back. At that point, it'll look just like Windows 7 with this additional tile thing available if you want to go there. I see. I think Microsoft has a little bit lost its way, I'm sorry to say. I hope their new CEO, Satya Nadella, will help them regain their mojo. Um, I have said for a few years now that my rule of thumb is Windows for business, Windows for the office, but Macintosh for the home, for the for the home user. Um, and I kind of stand by that. It is the last consumer operating system. I think Windows is really, um, is really more an enterprise uh, operating system. And in, ultimately, I think Windows will, Microsoft will become an enterprise, a business-focused company and not a consumer-focused company. I think that's one of the reasons they put Nadella in as CEO. Well, Leo, what about the AMD compared to? It's Intel? fine. If you're in a if you're in a budget situation, the AMD processors are less expensive. They're not as good as the Intel processors, but most people would never notice. Really? Yeah, I like i fives, the Intel Core Duo i five, based on the fourth generation, the Haswell processors. Better battery life, better speed, better processing, but they are more expensive. So budget computers often have AMD processors. Uh huh. That's fine. Now, is there any problem transferring my files from uh, XP to nope. uh, 8.0? No, Microsoft has a, a, a transfer wizard that'll that'll make that pretty easy. I would use this as an opportunity anyway to back up your data, uh, put it on an external hard drive. Right. It's just an excuse to do it, and it's in that you can never go wrong having more copies of your stuff. 
So my word processing. Uh, my ah, own. now apps, you're going to have to, you can't just copy over, obviously. You'll have to reinstall your applications. So I have to buy a new one. Um, yeah, you know what they've done, though, and I think this is good. I would look at uh, Microsoft's new office. You use, I, I take it you use Microsoft Word? Yes. Yeah. Their new office uh, deal um, is I th is inexpensive. I think it's a, but it's a monthly fee. I think it's ten dollars a month, eight dollars a month, something like that. Uh, and it's great. You can install it on multiple computers. Um, it's updated automatically. It's secure automatically. Uh, I think Office three sixty five is a very good choice, and and that's what I use actually. Okay. It's a subscription. Sometimes people that makes them a little nervous, but you know the 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 sticker shock of going to buy a new copy of Office is pretty steep. I, I, you know, when the last office came out, that was like three hundred dollars, and I just couldn't bring myself to spend three hundred dollars for office. Right. So uh, the monthly fee is a lot less, even you know, over a year or two, and uh, and it's automatically updated. It's kept up to date and so forth. The other choice is, of course, Office.com, which is online only, and that's free. And right. for many people who don't have, you know, don't really need heavy duty word processing, it's it's a very good choice. So no problem transferring my nope. files to... Apple. Applications are the issue. You'll have to reinstall them. And you will want to update them because apps that were written for Windows XP, probably time to get new ones. Yeah. yeah. And uh, my security system, my Norton and Linksys uh, Wi-Fi, it worked fine with that? Absolutely. Okay. And what about... I understand I read an article this morning in the Wall Street Journal that the printer drivers may not work. Well, that's right because your printer, your printer is, is it of the same vintage vintage as your office as your XP? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, they may not have written it, that printer is so old that just like Microsoft doesn't want to update XP, the company that made that printer probably isn't making updated drivers. Often, though, drivers for Vista or later will work. So you you know this is the cascade. Unfortunately, the upgrade cascade. You upgrade one thing, and then you have to upgrade a bunch more. And you may find, in fact, that your old printer doesn't work with Windows 8. You should check. There's a compatibility checker. So if you, then, if if it doesn't work, then I need to buy a new printer. Yeah, but printers are cheap. Yeah. Like really cheap. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, you, you don't see a problem going to 8.0. Everybody's or, doing it. All the kids, all the cool kids are doing it. I mean, this is kind well, of... Well, I know, but... You know, <laughs> this is, I know you always said 7 was the best. Well, I, you know, eventually you just have to say, uh, well, we're just going to bite the bullet and, and make, the, make the move because uh, what are you going to do? Um, yeah. The times have changed. And uh, we just kind of, we kind of, at some point you have to do it. So uh, Office 365 Home Premium, which includes off, includes Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, which is an excellent application, uh, was $99 a year. You can do a monthly, but $99 a year. Um, do you use Outlook? No. Okay. You also get Skype calling for free for a year so and some storage on there on, on uh, what was called SkyDrive is now called OneDrive. Can you just uh, buy uh, Word without the other? No, of course not. That would be uh, yeah. that would be crazy talk. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I don't know. Can you? Can I you know, I always see the office. I I don't ever see Word. Oh, okay. Um, can you let me ask the chat room. Can you just buy you ought to be able to Word standalone. Let's look at the Microsoft uh, store here. Office 365 Home and Student, Office 365 Home Premium. Uh, boy, if, if they sell Word by itself, they don't list it on their website. Okay. Wait a minute. Here it is. Yeah, $109. Word 2013. It's cheaper to buy Office. <laughs> $109. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, it's $100 a year versus $109 forever. But you get it on five computers, you get all the other stuff. I think it's probably a better deal to get the office premium. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I'm built to perform as well. I, you know, I briefly, I, so I started doing this in 1976, before you were born, Heather. I started doing this. 
And I've been doing it. What is that? I'm now in my 38th year as a broadcaster. Briefly, when I hit 30, so that was in the 80s, I thought, this is a silly job for a grown-up. So I decided to get a real, quote, real job. Uh, and it turned out, because I was really, you know, I knew a lot about computers. I, was a, I knew how to program. And so I got a job at a startup. Uh, it was called Paracomp. And the idea was, uh, this was in the 1986, to uh, parallel computing, originally for science, but then we broadened it to other applications. And the, eventually, by the way, the company merged with Macromedia and then sold to Adobe. And I think the founders made quite a bit of money. Uh, I should have made money, but, you know, the problem was I did it for three months, worked as a, in this startup, and I realized this is not me. I would stand up in the little cubicle farm and I'd do 10 minutes. I'd do, I'd do comedy because I, <laughs> I need to, I'm built to perform. So three months of that, I said, you can keep your stock. You're never going anywhere anyway. And <laughs> I'm going back to radio. Yeah, I could have been. I could have been one of those kids, is you know, living on the beach, enjoying life. But no, actually, I'm. I'm. It was the right thing to do. I'm very glad. It's kind of an interesting thing. I've been a tech guy. I've been covering this this business since the '70s. I started writing for Byte and Infoworld magazine in the late '70s. I've been doing a show like this, very much like this, since the early '90s, since Windows 3.1 and, and DOS 5. And uh, so I've watched this whole thing happen. Oh, you know, the tech boom. I've watched friends of mine have become millionaires. They've had their own little startups. They've taken off. They've gone places. And I've just been on the sidelines watching. And every once in a while, I thought, gee, I should have really, if I had just thought of doing a messenger app that I could have, I could have sold to Microsoft or Facebook or Yahoo for billions of dollars, I could, be, I could, I could own a basketball, professional basketball team right now. I could be, I could be, have courtside seats, but no, I like being on this. I realized I didn't, the reason I wasn't happy in the startup business is because I had to focus on one company, one sector, and I'm fascinated by all of it. I love, I've got ringside seats for a world that is absolutely changing. This is the industrial revolution for our time. We are, we are, we are, I mean, just look around you. It, it, 10 years ago, did people spend all their time looking at a little screen in their hand as they walked through the middle of the of traffic? No. <laughs> this is, the world has changed. I get in my car and I see a satellite map of where I am with my car superimposed on it. We live in the future. It's a, it's a pretty exciting time. And I'm, I feel very privileged to get to, to watch this, to meet the people who are changing the world. Yeah, sure, they're getting rich, but I... I feel like we're having we're we're having fun. This is the best job for a journalist cuz nobody dies. There's no nobody sheds blood in this, but it but it but these stories are changing. We're covering stuff that's changing our lives. Everything from how we work, how we play, how we worship, how we communicate. We are the world is changing. Uh let's move on. Uh, more calls. Hamid is next in Danbury, Connecticut. Hi Hamid. Hello, Leo. It's Hamid again. You remember me? I'm the guy that was talking to about the ransom and stuff. Uh, ah. I made a video on my iPhone Okay. that, that I'm going to upload on YouTube, and uh, I don't know how the heck do you even do that. I know you have to use iTunes for everything, so I don't understand how you do I it. I think your phone can do it. If you have a YouTube account registered on your phone... Uh, don't you? I, I, no, I haven't. I, yes, Heather's 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 a, a you know, iPhone user. I haven't used one in a while. Uh, you 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 just up. You press a button and it uploads to YouTube. You got it. But the key is you have to sign up for your YouTube account on the phone. YouTube, Vimeo, Facebook, and Twitter are all now built into iOS. Automatic sharing to those if you have iOS seven. So presuming you have them, even iOS six did YouTube. Presuming you have the most recent version of uh, iOS. Just, but the problem is you have to make sure you attach those accounts on your phone. Once you do, then on the video, there'll be a share button. You press it, and it says, send it to my YouTube account. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, you're right. You can also, if you wish, connect it up to iTunes, download it onto your computer, and do it from there. Uh, but I can't see any reason. Now, if you're worried about 3G bandwidth, you don't. if you've got bandwidth caps on your cell carrier, do it on Wi-Fi. Don't do it when you're out on the road. Um, there's also a YouTube app 
John in the chat room reminds me. Uh, you can download the YouTube app on your iPhone. Unlike Windows Phone, uh, there's a very good YouTube app for uh, iPhone, and uh, you can do that. But do uh, do uh, the YouTube Capture app will uh, do it as well. That's another app. Wow, we're, we're coming up with all sorts of ways to do this. If you shoot your video in the YouTube Capture app, uploads automatic. But in any event, uh, this, is, this is one thing that Apple makes very easy. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Vimeo are all kind of built into the operating system. By the way, if you do use iOS, very, very important, you should get an update announcement. Uh, you should have gotten one yesterday. Do not ignore it. Update your iOS to 7.0.6. If you're running an older version of iOS, check for an update there, too. There's a very serious flaw in iOS that allows a bad guy to exercise something called a man-in-the-middle attack. The bad guy gets between you and a secure server like your bank, Amazon, anywhere you're having a secure SSL communication and can actually intercept what is normally secure encrypted data. Uh, it's, a, it's a serious flaw, so serious that Apple's released an emergency update. We are expecting the, up, the big update to iOS 7, 7.1 to come out. Uh, in March. But in the meantime, this is not something to wait for. And apparently it's a flaw also in OS X in uh, Mavericks, but they have an issue to fix for it yet, uh, which is a cause for concern. It's probably a little more difficult to fix on the uh, desktop than it is on uh, the phone and the iPad. But boy, I, keep an eye peeled for an Apple update. Uh, and, and apply it immediately if you can. Is it serious enough that I would stop communicating with my bank? Well, gosh, that's hard for me to say. If you can avoid, I guess if you can avoid uh, using an SSL connection, like don't buy anything online, don't communicate with your bank, don't get your email. If you can avoid it, I would. I imagine Apple will have an update soon. Apple says it's coming very soon. They're working, I'm sure. I'm sure there are people at Apple who did not go to bed last night. But at last, the last time I checked, there was no update. So, yeah, if, if I were you, I would have... I couldn't, you know, if you can delay it, do. I have not. I've done it. Uh, I, bought, I bought something online this morning because I'm an addict and I can't stop myself. It's just something to be careful of. Very important update, I mean. Dave Hamilton, Montana, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Dave. Hi, Leo. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Good. Hey, I have a, uh, a Motorola Razor M. Got it about a year ago. Very nice phone. Yeah, I like it. Uh, two months ago, I got a Bluetooth headset. It works great. It would attach itself to the uh, voice commands on the phone when I press the little button on the Yeah, that's uh, nice, isn't headset. it? Yeah, yeah. And I could talk to it and make it dial. And then one day, it quit doing that. It would connect itself to Google on the phone, but it wouldn't go to the voice commands app anymore. And I exchanged the headset, got a brand new headset. Yeah, it sounds like it's the phone, but I don't, I'm afraid I, yeah. I'm not going to be much help here. I don't know. Let me think about it and we'll come back. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. If it's an, is there an Android setting that would say, I bet there is, don't uh, ignore voice commands? strong relationship with your team oh, it's a serious bug yeah man it's a very serious they they can't remember what it was i think they handled certificates poorly something like that all right i'm gonna choose so i'll turn off my mic enjoy what are the what's the throw button that's jump <laughs> never mind <laughs> i'll play that later not a demo version. That's a $10 full version. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Last segment of the uh, of the day of the show. Um, Going to see if I can get some calls in here. I did not find anybody who had a suggestion. I, it seems to me that um, Android, and I'm pretty sure the Droid M would count, does have settings where you say that are related to this, whether your voice commands work. I would check the settings. I'm not sure why it would uh, it would ignore you, Dave. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. I, I don't think it's the headset. I think it's just the settings. Yeah, I took it to the to the Verizon store and they suggested I get an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> Why I you wanna you know, they get they get a little cash payment when you when you trade up to the iPhone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, look in the uh, look in the. I've had two different people look at it. Nobody can <sighs> nobody can figure it out. Nobody in the chat room has any good idea. But I, I I do think it is in the settings. It is has something to do with voice command. It's a droid. It's so it would be. Uh, does it use uh, the Google voice commands or is it using its own? Yeah, uh, there was an app that came on the phone called Voice Command. Yeah, so it's yeah. You know, the mic works otherwise. You can make phone calls and everything. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you hear a beep when you press the button? Does it signal, oh, I hear you? It, it beeps, but then uh, it, it doesn't do anything when I look at the Here's phone, what, I, you know, okay, here's an interesting. Google, yeah, go into, check Google Now and make sure you've got Google Now enabled. I bet you it updated, and Google Now is, is now kind of the interface for all that. Um, you Certainly you go to the set the settings and language and input and make sure you've got it set there correctly but i bet you you also have to opt in to google now oh okay um it, so if, if you have the uh, uh google search bar on there just tap it it'll open google now make sure you opt into that it may be that it, this i get bet you this would happen it updated its android and google now takes over a lot of this voice command stuff and um, I bet you anything uh, that you haven't opted in, and that's why it's ignoring you. As soon as you opt in, it'll start working again. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll give that a try. What version is it? Four point two. Uh, bet it is. Four point one, I think. Uh, yeah. Well, look for a system update. Um, the, you know, the the, the Motorola uh, X and the later uh, droids. You just say, "Okay, Google now," and it listens and it goes, "Hello." Oh, it just did. On my phone. <laughs> um, so so that's, uh, try OK Google or OK Google Now. Go into this. Shh, shh, I'm busy. I'm working. Um, <laughs> it's a, it said, hi there, Leo. Can I help you? <laughs> um, I think it's something in there. Okay. All right, Richard. That'd be my best guess. I mean, David. Now Richard in Santa Clarita. Hi, Richard. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. So um, I, I've been doing a podcast, and I want to start doing some video. And I have a Canon T3i. Excellent. And I did. I got an extra microphone, and I plugged it into the camera. Um, and, boy, the sound quality was terrible. Yes. Uh, yes. So, so camera, I the on-camera microphones almost always are. Even when we had camcorders, they were. You'd hear the camera guy going, <sighs> Okay, hit it, Jimmy. Okay, Dad. <sighs> so it's the on-camera microphones the problem. Does your Canon have an external mic uh, connector? Usually, it's a mini. No, jack. no, no. That's what I'm saying. I was using. I got an. I got a microphone oh. and plugged it into the camera. Oh, it was you an external mic. Right. But it didn't work very well. No, the the sound quality was really. So really I use bad. the I use Rode's stereo uh, mic. They call it the stereo video mic. Uh, it goes. What's nice is it mounts into the uh, hot shoe for the flash, and then the little cable goes into the hole on the side of the camera, and the quality is superb. And it's stereo. It even comes with, pardon me, what they call a dead kitten, which is a giant muff that goes on the thing. Uh, that keeps the wind sound down. And I've had excellent results recording with this on a Canon camera. So uh, my suspicion is you just didn't get a great microphone. Huh. I I thought it was a really good What'd you get? quality. But, um, now, I've also heard of this magic lantern, but it looks kind of intimidating to me to use. Well, that would be... familiar with this? That would be after the fact. That software, uh, oh, oh, the Magic Lantern firmware. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that would make the sound better. It's fine. I use Magic Lantern all the time on my, uh, uh, I, it, this is a firmware update. It's one of the reasons to get a Canon camera. It's a firmware update that gives you more capability. I don't know if it would improve the sound quality. Does it say it will? Yeah, I thought that that was one of the things it was used for. All right, audio. Analog digital gain adjustments, selectable import, toggle wind filter, live audio monitoring. Yeah, I mean, it gives you more capabilities. I don't know if it's going to prove the quality. Okay. So the other option would be to record the sound on a separate device, but then I would have to sync all of it. When yeah, I no, no. Yeah, yeah. What mic did you get? 
Boy, I don't remember the name. It, yeah. it was. I think, you know, there are bad mics out there. I think you need, get the Rode. I've used it. I continue to use it. It's a great microphone. It's called the stereo, video stereo mic. Um, it's got left and right stereo. Stereo video mic. I'm sorry. Let me just see what the cost of this is. You know, you also might try. Now, that one's right on the camera. So it's good for ambient sound. It's good for a baseball game, that kind of thing. If you have somebody uh, who's 10 feet away and you just want their voice, you're going to want to get a shotgun mic, which is much more directional. You can also get those. But if you get a $10 microphone off eBay and it sounds bad, well, I'm not surprised. I think you need to get a better mic would be my guess. I don't think the firmware is going to make a difference. It gives you more capabilities, but it doesn't make the sound quality better. Uh, do we have time? We might have time for Joe. Let's see if we can get it in Chickatawaga, New York. Hi, Joe. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Good afternoon. Uh, I know when we donate computers and smartphones and start stuff like that, we're supposed to use something like D-Ban to uh, right. completely wipe the information uh, out of the device. Right. And we know it doesn't work so well for SSDs right. because you can't. Now, it, it occurred to me the other day when in my mom's escape that Ford Sync, it has all this uh, potentially personal information. It has Bluetooth pairings. It has contact information. How do I deban a Ford vehicle? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. That's a great question. So you're going to sell your car. I mean, I would wipe it. It is, you know, there is the capability in all of these cars to delete the pairings, to delete the data and all of that. Um, but I have to tell you, many's the time I've gotten in a rental car and it's been loaded with everybody else's phone book. And I could see the, all the names of the people who use it. The GPS, I could see places they went. In fact, isn't that isn't there a movie where uh, that's how they find the bad guy? Because they get the car that he rented and they, <laughs> and they go back to the same place he went to last time. So you make a very good point. Um, the good news is it's uh, it would take a fairly sophisticated bad guy to get the data off of there. He'd have to get the hard drive out of it and so forth. Mm -hmm. The bad news is I don't know of an easy way to do it. There's no d band for Fords that I know of. That's a very good question. I guess you just, all you, you're stuck. All you can do is use the uh, built-in uh, capability to delete accounts, delete that information, you know, clear your GPS data, and then make sure when you sell the car, you sell it to a nice person. If he, <laughs> if he looks shady, don't... <laughs> I'll sell it to him. And if you're a bad guy on the run, hey. Thanks for the call. Thanks for the questions. Thanks for joining me this weekend. I'll see you next weekend. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, that's it for the tech guy show for today. I'm Leo Laporte. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, the tech guy is just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows now on the Twit Netcast Network, and you'll find them all at twit.tv. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPad on iPad Today. You get your daily dose of tech news from Tech News Today and our weekly roundtable show this week in tech. It's all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next time with another great Tech Guy podcast. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.